So we have to go into community adjustment first. Start going right here. Dan's ready for us. Ready to go? Okay. I keep forgetting about those two up there. I've been watching the advice when they do. Prompted you only once since they raised that. They do raise their hands for voting. That's okay. I need to include the points. I feel bad about that. All set. Thank you very much. Um, so we are um, <coughs> sitting as council right now. We do need to move into the committee of adjustment. The motion before us is that council adjourn its regular meeting in order to sit as a committee of adjustment under section 45 of the Planning Act RSO 1990 as amended to consider the minor variance applications listed on the October 27, 2021 agenda. Could I have a, a mover, please? Uh, Councillor Cates and Councillor Shipley, all in favor? And that is carried, thank you very much. So just before we get started, I'm going to do my usual preamble and uh, remind everyone what the process is. Members of the public that are participating virtually in this evening's public meeting have previously provided notification to the municipal clerk in advance of the meeting. If anyone wishes to further receive notification on any minor variance applications being considered tonight, I ask that you please send an email to planning at middlesexcenter.on.ca requesting further notification. Please be advised that comments expressed and written material presented are a matter of public record for full disclosure. If you have any questions on any of the applications being heard this evening, we ask that you direct those to the appropriate planner on file. Members of the public that have requested to speak will be given a maximum of five minutes to address council and provide comments on applications. In keeping with our procedural bylaw and our R zone policy, I would remind all of our meeting participants to use respectful language and uphold values of cooperation, trust, and openness. Um, the order of proceedings is going to be the same for each of the applications and um, is as follows. The chair, that is myself, will ask the planner to explain the purpose of the application and hearing and to present the staff report. The applicant or their agent has the opportunity to speak to their application. The public who have registered to participate will be asked for their comments and questions. Please ensure that you state your name and address so that comments can be reflected in the minutes. The municipal clerk will provide any additional comments received from circula circulated agencies and the public not included in the planning report. Then I'll turn to the uh, committee and um, ask, uh, ask them for questions to um, the applicant and or staff. And then I will consider motions regarding the applications. So the first file that is before us tonight is um, an application for minor variance. And Dan Fitzgerald, our planner, is going to give the overview of the planning report. And Dan. Through the chair to all members of the meeting. Um, so the purpose and effect of application uh, for minor variance A25 slash 2020 uh, is to seek relief from the Middlesex Center Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw as it does relate to the maximum permissible uh, gross floor area as well as height for an accessory building in the uh, Community Residential First Density or CR1 zone. Uh, the applicant is requesting a maximum size for all buildings, um, accessory on the land of 200 square meters. Uh, whereas Middlesex Center Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw currently permits a maximum size of 50 square meters or 3% lot coverage, whichever is lesser. Uh, the applicant in this case is also requesting a maximum permissible height of 8.8 .8 meters, uh, whereas uh, the zoning bylaw permits a maximum height of 5.5 meters. Uh, the effect of the proposal is to facilitate uh, the construction of one accessory building uh, which would be used as a detached garage, as well as a pool house and a covered outdoor living space. Uh, so as the committee may recall, uh, the proposed application was brought forward on January 20th, 2021. Um, at that time, the applicant was requesting permission to build two separate accessory buildings, uh, one which was located in front of the main dwelling, uh, abutting the neighboring rear yards, 
uh, and another behind the house. Uh, committee at that point did vote uh, to defer the application, uh, which would permit staff to work with the applicant uh, and owner to consider repositioning the accessory building on the lands. Um, so as shown in the revised proposal, which is included in the planning report, uh, the applicant has revised um, revised their initial plan by removing the detached garage in front of the main dwelling and consolidating it uh, behind the house with the proposed pool shed. So in doing so, they have addressed the concerns surrounding the proposed location, abutting the rear yard of the existing residential property. Uh, staff did receive one comment um, from a neighboring landowner commend, uh, commending uh, the owner for revising the plan and moving the detached uh, garage behind the house away from the abutting property lines of the rear yards. Uh, no other comments were received from any internal departments as well as external aid. So as noted in the planning report, uh, planning staff maintains that the proposed minor variance does meet the four, uh, four tests for uh, as outlined in the planning act. I therefore I am recommending that the minor variance application be approved uh, subject to the condition that the accessory building be constructed in the same general location as outlined in the applicant's plan. So thank you, and I'm certainly available to answer any questions that you may have. Okay, thank you for that presentation, Dan. Um, we do have Mr. Paul Crocker, um, who's representing the applicant, uh, registered to speak. And he's coming up now. Starting video. Uh, hello, you're you're here now. Very good. Thank you, and uh, thank you to the council for uh, hearing us at this time. Yes, as uh, Mr. Fitzgerald was so kind to point out, uh, the owner has really worked hard to try to address address the uh, issues that were brought up before. Uh, at this point, we're hoping that uh, this um, provides a, an in faith measure, and it's nice to hear the positive comment back from the neighbor regarding that as well. Uh, I think all of the matters have been clearly laid out by Mr. Fitzgerald at this time. So uh, we're really looking forward to try to work with the community in, in this endeavor for sure. I'll leave it at that because it was so well covered. Well, righty then, thank you very much. Um, I'll look to, uh, to the committee for any questions. Anyone wanting? No, I see no hands anywhere. Um, in that case, the motion before us is that minor variance application A25-2020 fi filed by Kalandit's Land Surveyors on behalf of David Walker for relief from the Comprehensive Zoning Bylaws maximum size and height of an accessory building where the applicant is requesting a maximum size of 200 meters squared, whereas the zoning bylaw permits maximum size of the lesser of 50 square meters of gross floor area and 3% lot coverage for all accessory buildings and to permit a maximum height of 8.8 .8 meters, whereas the zoning bylaw permits maximum height of 5.5 for a lot municipally known as 147 Harris Road be granted subject to a number of conditions um, that the accessory building be constructed in the same general location specified in the application submission. And further that the reasons for granting the variance application include the, uh, the request complies with general intent and purpose of Middle Stack Center's official plan, and um, it complies with the general intent and purpose of our zoning bylaw. The request is minor in nature and it represents appropriate development on the subject property. Uh, could I have a mover please and a seconder? Uh, I see Councillor Scott's hand and, oh, did you have a question, Councillor? Oh, okay, go ahead, um, I'll, you can second it then. So we have Councillor Scott and Councillor Cates. Is um, everyone in favor? And that motion is carried. Uh, thank you very much, Dan, for that. And Mr. Crocker, we'll move to item number two and uh, go ahead and present the report then for us, if you will. Thank you, members of the committee. So uh, for item 9.2, uh, application of minor variance, file number A31 slash 2021. I just wanna note for committee, there is an error on the staff report that's included on the website, as well as the recommendation that's included on the website. 
does reference the wrong application number. It references A23 slash 2021. So just for clarification, uh, the change has been made in the decision tonight before council, or sorry, before the committee, it is A31 slash 2021. As well, the address on this particular property is, a, is 111 Erie Avenue and not 105 Huron Avenue, uh, which has been changed on the report online. Just wanted to note that to um, maybe before we started here. Uh, so the Thank you. So the purpose and effect of the application uh, minor variance A31 slash 2021 um, is to seek relief from the Conference of Zoning Bylaw as it does relate to the maximum permissible gross floor area for an accessory building, uh, which is located in the urban residential first density uh, UR1 zone. Uh, the applicant is requesting a maximum size of 125 square meters for all accessory buildings, uh, whereas the uh, Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw does permit a maximum size as the lesser of 50 square meters or 3% lot coverage. Uh, in this case, that would be 50 square meters given the lot size. Uh, the effect of the proposal is to facilitate the construction of an additional accessory building on the lands, uh, which is stated for the intended purpose of residential storage, while also maintaining an existing accessory building, which is used as a pool house and located towards the rear of the property. A uh, site plan has been included as attachment two to the planning report, uh, which does depict both. Uh, so as noted, the subject property is located at uh, 111 Erie Avenue in Kamoka. Uh, it is approximately 0.5 acres in area, the frontage of approximately 37 meters on Erie Avenue. It is located on the northwest side of the intersection at Delaware Street South and Erie Avenue in Kamoka. It's surrounded on all sides by residential development, uh, generally in the format of larger lot, single detached dwellings. It is designated settlement area in the Middlesex County official plan, uh, residential in Middlesex Center's official plan, and is zoned a urban residential first density exception uh, three zone in Middlesex Center's comprehensive zoning bylaw. Uh, upon circulation of the application, uh, we did not receive any comments from the public uh, and we did not receive any objections from any internal departments as well as external agencies. Uh, staff do note that the intent of the applicant is to construct a new accessory building, uh, which is located adjacent to the existing single detached dwelling uh, while also maintaining an existing accessory building, which is located at the rear of the property. So as noted in the planning report, I did uh, state that the proposal that meets the intent of the four tests of the Planning Act. Additionally, I would also note that while the overall size of the accessory building does exceed the intent of the zoning bylaw, uh, together both buildings do remain subordinate to the principal dwelling. And the overall site coverage of the zoning bylaw uh, for development in the UR1-3 zone uh, would still comply with this proposal. So given the above, as indicated in the planning report, I am recommending that minor variance application A31-2021 uh, be approved. Thank you, and I'm certainly available to answer any questions you may have. Thank you for the report then. Um, okay. Alrighty, in that case, um, I can ask uh, the committee, are there any questions regarding the application? Go ahead, Councillor Case. Through you, Madam Mayor, to uh, to Dan, um, I don't have a problem with anything. I just wanted clarification on your page two, where you say requirements, and then you say relief requested. Um, you said, or an additional an additional six percent lot coverage. Is it an additional for a total of nine, or is it uh, a total of six? Uh, through the chair for so safe for clarification it's it's um six percent lot coverage in total so not not nine percent it would be six percent okay so the additional is the wrong word okay thank you councillor shipley thank you through the mayor to dan just by your map here dan there is a garage up by the house um is it an attached garage or a separate garage you know the size of that through the chair to um, also Shipley, there is an, ex an existing attached garage on the house. Is that what you mean? Yeah, so it was attached, not attached, yes. Yeah. Uh, so the existing house does have an attached garage. I believe it's approximately a double car garage. Um, I'd have to defer to the applicant to know for sure, but I believe it is a double car garage. Uh, the intended uh, purpose for the accessory building, as, as noted by the applicant, 
uh, is more so to store uh, recreational type vehicles uh, that they do have um, for personal use. Okay, thanks, Dan. Is there anyone else? I don't see any hands. Um, I skipped a, a part here. We did receive an additional comment and the clerk will take care of reading that. Sure, uh, for the committee's benefit, I just wanted to note that one additional comment was received via email on Tuesday evening from a neighboring property owner. They just noted their uh, general opposition to the application. They did not state further than that. Thank you. Okay, forgive me. I do have one question and I don't, um, I was just trying to clarify that item. Is the accessory building, um, does it have garage doors? Is it functioning as a garage when it's not an accessory building or, or is that what you asked? I wasn't clear. Okay. I just wondered what was the, what was the sort of structure of the building like? Is it, is it more of a shed or is it more of a, a drive-through kind of garage or is it, um, yeah, I, I'm not quite sure. I was just trying to understand what it looks like, what it is. Uh, through the chair to, uh, to the chair. Uh, so in this in this particular instance, the uh, the plans that they had shown uh, basically shows a garage door facing Erie Avenue, uh, and then it's just a, a typical detached uh, garage structure basically behind that. So they're they've shown a a, a single uh, I think twenty foot wide door on the front, uh, which would be the, you know a standard standard for a detached garage. Yeah. Okay. Because it does, it is described as a quote, new storage garage. So I was just trying to be clear there. Okay. That's good. Is there anything else? All right. Well, in that case, we have a motion before us and that is um, that minor variance application A23, 2021 filed by Frank Lepore for relief from the comprehensive zoning bylaw in order to establish a maximum size of 125 square meters or 6% lot coverage for all accessory buildings, whereas the zoning bylaw permits a maximum size of the lesser of 50 square meters of gross floor area or 3% uh, lot coverage for property municipally known as 111 Erie Ave be granted. And that the reasons for granting the minor variant application are that the request complies with the general intent and purpose of Middlesex Center's official plan, the request complies with the general intent and purpose of Middlesex Center zoning bylaw. The request is minor in nature and the request represents appropriate development on the subject property. Uh, could I have a mover, please, and a second? Councillor Cates and Councillor Shipley, all in favor? And that is carried. Thank you very much. Moving on to 9.3 now, um, another minor variance for Clark Road. Uh, through the chair of the members of the committee. So before I get started on this one, I will share my screen. A little bit more of a complex. Everyone can see that uh, the purpose and effect of this particular application for minor variance, uh, which is A32 slash 2021, um, is to seek an interpretation of a defined use, uh, that being recycling facility to permit a more broad type of organics for, uh, recycling, um, that being the addition of food waste, uh, whereas the current definition speaks in specifics, uh, such as yard waste and does not include that broader interpretation for organics. Uh, the effect of the proposal is to facilitate the expansion of types of recycled materials and diversification of the operation for tri recycling. Uh, which is located at 21462 Clark Road in Middlesex. Uh, site plan has also been included as an attachment to of the planner's report, which gives you a general idea as to uh, what the site will look like in terms of operating. Uh, the subject lands are located on the east side of Clark Road, uh, south of the intersection at Clark Road and Medbay Road. Uh, the subject property consists of an existing recycling facility operation, which is known as tri recycling, uh, which does break down common yard waste and construction waste materials and turns them into recycled products. Uh, they contain an area that is regulated by the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority. Uh, also, the abutting lands to the east are currently owned and operated by tri recycling um, as an additional recycling facility site. 
which is primarily for construction related waste material recovery. Uh, lands to the south are located within the city of London's jurisdiction and are generally used for resource extraction. Uh, lands to the immediate west are used for both industrial purposes as well as ag um, agricultural land and crop production. And lands to the north consist generally of agricultural land and crop production. So the subject land is designated agricultural area in the County of Middlesex official plan. It's uh, designated parks and recreation in Middlesex Center's official plan. Uh, additionally, the lands are also identified as an aggregate resource area and uh, are subject to the policies of special policy area number 11 in uh, the Middlesex Center official plan. Uh, the lands are zoned a site-specific extractive industrial exception zone, which is M4-1 in the zoning bylaw. No comments were received from the public during circulation of this application and uh, agencies or internal departments did not list any objections. And so as identified in the planning report, um, staff have reviewed the application under section 45.2, subsection B of the Planning Act, uh, which does provide the committee with the authority to permit the use of lands uh, so long as such use generally conforms uh, with the uses that are permitted within the existing zoning bylaw. Um, in review of the applicant's proposal, planning staff are of the opinion that the proposed inclusion of organics recycling uh, within the existing permitted use of recycling facility does represent a natural extension and an appropriate interpretation of the existing permitted uses. Additionally, staff are of the opinion that the proposal meets the four tests of the Planning Act and generally agree that the proposed use will be subject to further review by the Ministry of Environment, as well as site plan control. Uh, given the above, staff are of the opinion that any negative impact can and will be appropriately addressed for further um, approvals. Uh, therefore, I am recommending that application minor variance A32-2021 uh, be approved. Uh, subject to the condition that the organic recycling shall not include such uses as biosolid recycling or dead stock recycling. So thank you, and I'm certainly available to answer questions on this. Uh, thank you for that report. I have Matt Campbell, who's registered to speak on behalf of the applicant speaking next. the way it goes just as soon as you think you're on you're not and then you have to start all over again <laughs> yeah, just bear with us for one minute committee it's, it's matt Hi, here. can you hear me yes we can hear you now <laughs> okay <laughs> that's right. the way it goes doesn't it you just want it's... to get in and then the next thing you know you're popped out all, Go all good. I was, uh, I was just a little taken aback there. I was uh, talking to a screen that evidently nobody can hear me. Um, <laughs> well, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, uh, Mayor Debit, and and thank you to uh, the committee for having us this evening, um, and thanks to uh, Dan for providing the presentation. Um, there's just a couple of additional points I would like to make for the committee's um, consideration of uh, of our request. Um, what Tri Recycling does on site right now, and there's images of, of the actual process that were included in our submission materials, um, is organics recycling. And it predominantly leaf and yard waste that's, uh, that's done on the site. And the, the specific way that this is done is in a windrow system. There's, there's linear um, piles of material that are broken down over time. It's about a six week time frame, and they're continually um, turned over and ground up. And then um, at the end of the process, those materials that have gone through the recycling process are then blended with a, a range of other materials and then sold as um, uh, garden additives, soil additives, and good stuff for the landscape. Now, the request that we have uh, before the committee this evening is it's, it's the exact same use. It's just a similar and broader range of materials 
that are being requested to uh, to be, um, as as Dan mentioned, um, interpreted with under the the recycling facility definition. And the reason that we're before you is because that definition makes specific reference to certain organic materials, but doesn't include um, the full range of organic materials that under the, um, the Ministry of Environments uh, definition of organics would be included. So this is part of a broader uh, program of looking at accepting a broader range of organic materials for recycling uh, at Tri Recycling's facility. That would include, say, a green bin program or materials from, say, a food processing facility uh, that may not make it into the final product uh, or certain materials that, say, were not up to uh, food standards, so they have to be recycled. Occasionally, we see that sort of, um, of product that would go to, say, uh, a, um, a dairy farm or something like that for, for cows. Uh, in this case, it would be a product that would go to Tri Recycling's facility and then gone through the recycling process and blended into that, uh, that soil additive product uh, at the end. The process that is, is being proposed here, as is outlined in the materials that we've submitted, is, is very similar to what occurs right now, uh, with the main difference being a little bit more uh, infrastructure, being um, some more robust stormwater management system and uh, additional ventilation that would actually go under, excuse me, underneath the product. Um, we're not anticipating any sort of uh, offsite impacts beyond what currently exists now. No soil, no, sorry, no uh, odor, no dust, um, and, and no additional noise, nothing like that. Um, I would I would encourage the committee to review the materials uh, that we have provided. There's a, there's a very robust description of the proposal, including uh, some diagrams that goes over the, the proposal. Um, and one thing that we would like to remind the committee of is that any changes that occur on site, whether it is a, uh, a, a physical change to the site itself, whether there's uh, soil being moved around or machinery being moved around or anything like that, or the actual use on the site, like we're talking about uh, today, it would be a, a minor change to the use. That requires approval from the Ministry of Environment through the environmental compliance approval process. And again, we've detailed that in our submission materials. That is an extremely robust and detailed process that Tri-Recycling has gone through for its existing operations right now. Um, it, the document is about as big as a, a phone book or several phone books, and it has a, a very, very robust and detailed um, plan as to what recycling is permitted to do and what they're not permitted to do. And in the, in the case of what's before the committee this evening, uh, MECP would have to approve that as part of a future environmental compliance approval. Uh, and that would include a site plan and the requirement for a statutory public meeting. Um, additionally, for the for committee's consideration, the municipality would be looking at approving uh, a future site plan that would have already been uh, reviewed by MECP in order to, um, to wrap up the actual uh, site design for the site. Um, so if there's any questions on the actual uh, operation or anything to do with tri recycling, um, I can uh, answer some of those. We also have Jim Graham of Tri Recycling who is present and can uh, assist in answering any questions that the committee may have. Um, I do have just one uh, technical question um, that may be to Dan. Uh, the question is the staff report and the recommendation refer to an interpretation of a use. Uh, whereas the request was a, a variance to the definition. I don't, I think we're all on the same page here about what the end result would be. I was just wondering if we can get some clarification as to how that would work out in a technical sense, in a, uh, in a decision. I'll look to Dan for the answer there. Yeah, through the chair to um, Matt. So the, yeah, the, we stated as an interpretation to the definition, but it would, effectively add the term organics to the definition for this property. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. And now um, I have listed um, Jim Gray, 
uh, speaking, would we just wait to see if there's a question or would you like to say a few words? Uh, Madam Mayor, Council and staff, I'm happy just to provide a little context. Uh, this is our 30th anniversary uh, as a company. Uh, we've been at the forefront of composting, start being one of the first composters in the province for 25 years. We currently compost 40 to 50,000 tons of leaf and yard waste for municipalities throughout southwestern Ontario. By the time we're done composting it, all of our product uh, goes to Scott's, and it is approximately 60 to 80 percent of any Miracle Grow product that you will buy in uh, in central Canada and, and in the northeastern United States. Uh, we're very proud of, of uh, leading uh, organics and, and composting over the past 25 years. We meet uh, what's called the Compost Quality Alliance approval that uh, says we make the best possible material from nature's uh, input. Uh, their organics and composting has developed significantly over the last 25 years. Uh, we're all familiar with some operations in London that were first generation. We're on third and fourth generation. We don't hear about the hundreds of thousands of tons being composted properly from Toronto and other major municipalities. Uh, the facilities work, they make a high quality product, they keep it out of the landfill. And it's something that uh, uh, is going to be required, mandated by the province for all large and mid-sized municipalities in the next several years. Uh, we'd like to be doing this in Middlesex Center like we do leaf and yard waste and, uh, and be setting the bar for waste diversion in the organic side. The term, uh, the term organics clarifies for the ministry uh, a little bit better than just composting leaf and yard waste. For instance, if we take uh, coffee grounds right now, technically uh, we are out of compliance with our zoning, coffee grounds are the way to add nitrogen to leaf and yard waste at certain parts of the process to make that high quality finished product. So uh, that's, uh, that's what we're trying to align ourselves and make sure that the, uh, the zonings that we, we worked with 25 years ago now align with what the ministry is looking for. We can't proceed with looking at any changes to our ECAs until, until the zoning aligns with the terms that the, uh, the province uses. Uh, it is uh, the most regulated site in your municipality. We are governed from what type of waste we take to the times we're open, to how we, we monitor and register every customer, how we process everything they bring in, uh, the types of equipment, whether it's a loader or a bulldozer, the training of, our, uh, the training of every person within our organization from uh, a general laborer to an equipment operator, uh, and uh, we've got significant oversight from the ministry, which we welcome. Uh, just, uh, just as a, a heads up, I think uh, if you took the 150,000 tons a year of C&D waste, construction demolition waste that we recycle at Middlesex Center, as well as the 40, 50,000 tons of leaf and yard waste, Middlesex Center probably has the highest diversion rate of any municipality in Ontario. And we can be proud of that. We do it uh, without any offsite impact and we're keeping it out of the landfill. So uh, look forward to adjusting the, uh, this, uh, the wording so that we can bring future ideas to Middlesex Center that will allow us to continue to be the, uh, the, thought, the thought leader for uh, how to do it right throughout the rest of Ontario. Thank you. Thank you. I'll look to our council then for questions. Councillor Arts. Um, through you, Madam Mayor, <clears throat> I guess, uh, I guess it's a question. Um, I'm not referring to your operation, but there is other operations that they have quite an odor. But by reading the documentation here, I'm assuming the the MECP is going to regulate your odors also. Like you'll have parameters that you have to follow. But I imagine you have parameters you have to follow now too. Uh through you, Madam Chair, to, to, to Councillor Hertz. Yeah, the, uh, the MOC, MOECP, as part of any application to take in any additional materials, will look at those materials, look at the potential for any offside impact or liability, and then they will build in standards as to uh, how, what they, that we have to meet, achieve, as well as if there is an issue, how we would register both with, with the municipality and the MOECP a complaint. Uh, they've learned a lot in the last 20 years uh, around organics. And uh, again, 
we're in third, fourth generation of systems to do it without offsite impact. Uh, and uh, I think the MOECP learned from, uh, from that large facility in South London, uh, many lessons. And uh, again, there's, there's uh, hundreds of thousands of tons of waste going to, uh, food waste going to facilities throughout the province. And we don't hear about those. They are third generation facilities, uh, unlike the one that uh, constantly clouds us uh, in South London. Thank you. Okay, are there any other questions? I don't see any more hands. Um, we have a motion before us that minor variance application A32 2021 uh, filed by, oh yes, Lenko Priamo, Matt Campbell, on behalf of Tri, Tri Recycling Inc. for relief from the comprehensive zoning bylaw in order to permit an interpretation of a defined use that is being, that is being a recycling facility to permit organics recycling, including materials such as food waste, in addition to those products currently included in the definition for a property municipally known as 21462 Park Road be granted subject to the following condition, that the interpretation applied to the term organics shall not include the recycling of biosolids, for example, sanitary waste and or dead stock, and that the reasons for granting minor variance application A32-2021 um, are that the request complies with the general intent and purpose of Middlesex Centre's official plan. The request complies with the general intent and purpose of Middlesex Centre's comprehensive zoning bylaw. The request is minor in nature and the request represents appropriate development on the subject property. I'll call, oh no, I need a mover to seconder. Councillor Cates and uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan, all in favor? And that is, oops, carried. Um, congratulations on your anniversary and always interesting. I always learn something when you're speaking to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thanks, Council staff. Thanks very much. All, all right. Good night then. Um, we're looking at 9.5 now. Uh, Dan is, oh, sorry, I skipped ahead. I did turn the page and I jumped to the bottom. My mistake. Sorry, 9.4, but still Dan presenting the report. There we go. Uh, through the chair, yeah, thanks, committee. Um, so, in section nine point or item nine point four, um, the purpose and effect of this application for minor variance is to seek relief uh, from the comprehensive zoning bylaw as it relates to the maximum permissible gross floor area and a reduced interior and rear set yard setback uh, for an accessory building uh, in the urban residential first density zone. Uh, the applicant is requesting a maximum size of 42.3 square meters or 6.2% uh, lot coverage, uh, whereas the zoning bylaw permits a maximum size of the lesser of 50 square meters um, or 3% lot coverage, uh, which in this case would be a maximum permissible size of 20.3 square meters based on 3% lot coverage. Um, additionally, the applicant is requesting to reduce the required interior as well as rear yard setbacks for an accessory building to 0 0.06 meters or two feet, uh, whereas the bylaw requires a minimum of 1.5 meters or approximately 4.9 feet. Uh, the effect of the proposal is to facilitate the construction of one accessory building, uh, which is to act as a pool shed. So with that said, the, this subject property is located at uh, 126 Prince Street in Kamoka. It is approximately 678 square meters in area uh, with a frontage of 20 meters on Prince Street. It is located on the west side of Prince Street, uh, north of the intersection at Prince and Duke. Uh, the lands currently contain a single detached dwelling. Uh, the land surrounding on all sides um, are residential uh, in the format of single detached dwellings. Uh, also, the lands are designated settlement area in the county official plan. They are designated residential in Middlesex Center's official plan, um, and they are zoned in urban residential first density, UR1 zone, in the zoning bylaw. And no comments were received from the public during circulation of the application and uh, no objections from agencies as well as internal departments uh, were noted. 
so staff do note that the intent of the applicant is to construct an accessory building for storage, uh, as well as to act as a pool house to hold and host the equipment. Uh, the proposal to reduce the interior and rear yard setbacks, as well as the height, are considered to meet the four tests of a minor variance. Uh, and therefore, I am recommending that the application be approved. Thank you, and I'm certainly available to answer any questions you may have. All right, thank you for that report, Dan. Um, we don't have anyone registered to speak to this application uh, from, from the public or on behalf of the applicant, so I can look to council now for any questions. Or, pardon me, the committee to council. No one has questions? I have one. <laughs> um, when I look at the drawing of, of the site plan of the, um, the building and its location, it's probably just because it's on paper, but I'm wondering how easy is it to get a lawnmower around that building to um, affect the proper maintenance of grass and weeds behind it and around it? Uh, to the chair, uh, to the mayor, yeah, no, that's a that's a good point. Um, so it does still leave a two foot gap around the building, uh, which in terms of maintenance processes should provide enough space to squeeze in there and maintain any any space in, in between uh, the applicant could also choose to um, put down landscaping fabric and um, you know rock or stone or something of that nature to, to get around the fact of having to, to get around the building and perform maintenance tests okay i just wonder about that and the drip edge and all that kind of thing then obviously the two feet accommodates any water then uh, through the chair yeah that's correct so the the, in terms of the maximum permitted encroachment section of the bylaw, um, they would not be able to encroach close to 0.6 of a meter for any eave line. Um, so the eave line would still have to basically end at that 0.6. Okay, then thank you very much. Um, I don't see any hands still. So I, we, we do have um, a motion before us that minor variance application uh, A5 2021 filed by Luke Oslislo. On behalf of Jason Borbath for relief from the comprehensive zoning bylaw in order to establish an interior site yard and rear side yard setback of 0 0.6 meters on the north exterior side yard and rear yard setback of 0 0.6 meters for an accessory building, whereas the Middlesex comprehensive zoning bylaw requires a minimum interior side yard and rear yard setback for an accessory building of 1.5 meters and to permit a maximum size of 42.3 square meters for the accessory building whereas the zoning bylaw permits the maximum size of the lesser of 50 square gross floor, uh, pardon me, 50 square meters of gross floor area or 3% lot coverage for property municipally known as 126 Prince Street be granted. And that the reasons for granting the variance include that the request complies with the intent and purpose of our official plan and the general intent and purpose of our comprehensive zoning bylaw. It is minor in nature and it represents appropriate development on the subject property. Uh, is there a mover and a seconder, please? Councillor Shipley and Councillor Arts, all in favor? Okay, everyone's voted. That is granted, and we can move now to 9.5. And that is, uh, again, Dan, another minor variance application. Uh, through the chair, thanks, committee. Um, so 9.5 is a minor variance application, uh, which is A34 slash 2021, uh, which does seek relief from the bylaw to permit the construction of a single detached dwelling on the subject land. Um, the applicant is seeking relief uh, from section 5.2.3 uh, of the zoning bylaw, which states that construction of a single unit dwelling shall not be permitted except in accordance with the minimum distance separation or MDS-1 standards. Uh, as for MDS-1, uh, the applicant is requesting uh, a reduced setback to 78.7 meters, uh, whereas they require a MDS setback of 181 meters uh, from an existing livestock barn uh, that is located on the abutting property to the north, uh, that being uh, 9985 Fern Hill Drive. Hopefully everyone can see that there. Uh, the subject property is a uh, approximately one hectare, one acre, a non-conforming agricultural parcel, uh, which is used for residential purposes and is on the north side of Poplar Hill Road, 
on the northeast corner of the intersection at Poplar Hill and Fernhill Drive. Uh, the subject land is surrounded by agricultural lands and traditionally severed residential properties along uh, Poplar Hill Road. Uh, the property is designated agricultural area in the county official plan, uh, agricultural in Middlesex Center's official plan, uh, and is zoned agricultural A1 zone in Middlesex Center's comprehensive zoning bylaw. So as noted, uh, the applicant is requesting permission to reduce the minimum required MDS1 setback uh, related to a neighboring livestock barn, which is located at 9985 Fernhill Drive, uh, which is shown here north of the property. Um, so as, as required, uh, the setback would be um, as figured out by um, our chief building official, 181, uh, sorry, 181, uh, meters, uh, and they're uh, requesting to reduce to 78.7 meters. Uh, it is important to note that the approval of the minor variance uh, would not affect the existing livestock barn, which currently um, appears to be vacant on the property. Uh, the applicant has noted that they are requesting the reduction uh, due to the existence of the nature of the lot, as well as achieving the desired placement of a residential home on the uh, planning staff did not receive any comments from the public uh, or as neighboring landowners in this case upon circulation of the application. Additionally, no internal departments or agencies have expressed any concerns related to the application. So as noted in the report, uh, the applicant's request for a minor variance is specific to establishing a house uh, within the required setback distance of an existing operation. Uh, the reduction to MDS-1 standard would not affect the existing livestock uh, facility. Additionally, the existing development already falls within MDS-2 setback requirements. Or sorry, additionally, uh, the existing development already falls within uh, MDS-2 setback requirements. So as such, no further expansion would be permitted of the livestock operation on the lands. Uh, therefore, uh, given the above, I am recommending that the application be approved and they do not anticipate any negative impacts to the abutting. Thank you, and I'm certainly available to answer any questions uh, that you have on this one. Uh, thank you. Uh, let me just check here. We have the applicant, uh, Thomas Weischer, available uh, for questions or comments. Well, thank you for taking our application. Um, the only other additional comments I would like to make is that we do have a demolition permit um, for demolishing the existing detached structure as well as the existing uh, single family dwelling that is two story um, and is constructed very close, if not over the property line um, off of Poplar Hill Road and Fern Hill Road at the intersection. So, um, with the granting of this uh, minor variance application, we would then proceed with the demolition of that existing uh, house, which would help with uh, being able to see oncoming traffic off that road. But I did a very good job with the report, and uh, that's all. Uh, thank you for that, then. Um, next, we um, are looking for questions from the committee. There are no other comments received from the public, so. I see shaking heads. Something on the screen. Okay, that means there's no one who wants to ask anything. We can move right to the uh, motion, which is that minor variance application, A34, 2021, filed by Thomas Weister on behalf of Rainer and Deborah Jensen for relief from the comprehensive zoning bylaw in order to establish a reduced minimum distance separation one for a new single detached dwelling from an existing livestock facility at 78.72 meters. Where's the Middlesex Center comprehensive zoning bylaw based on minimum distance separation calculations would require a minimum of 181 meters to a new single detached dwelling for a property legally described as part lot five on concession 13 in the municipality of Middlesex Center, County Middlesex uh, be granted. And that the reasons for granting this variance are that it complies with the general intent um, purpose of our official plan as well as our center, um, Middlesex Centre Comprehensive Zoning Bylaw, 
It is minor in nature and the request represents appropriate development on the subject property. Do I have a mover, please, and a seconder? Uh, Councillor Cates and Councillor Arts, all in favor? And that is granted. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, at this point, we're done with the Committee of Adjustment and we need to reconvene as Council and move into public session. So the motion before us is that the Committee of Adjustment reconvene as Council and we move into public, uh, planning public meetings pursuant to the Planning Act, RS 1990 as amended, to consider the planning applications listed on tonight's Council agenda. Could I have a mover, please, and a seconder? Councillor Scott and Councillor Cates. And all in favor? And we are now sitting as uh, a planning meeting. So uh, again, I'm going to review the um, routine just so that we can refresh that for people who have joined us since I said this last. Members of the public that are um, participating virtually in this evening's public meetings have provided notification to the municip municipal clerk in advance of the meeting. If anyone wishes to receive further notification on any of the applications being considered tonight, I ask that you please send a request an email to planning at middlesexcenter.on.ca requesting further notification. Please be advised that comments expressed and written material presented are a matter of public record. If you have questions on any of the applications being heard this evening, we ask that you direct those to the appropriate planner on the file. Those who have requested to speak will be given a maximum of five minutes to address council and provide comments on the applications. In keeping with our procedural bylaw and our RSO policy, I would remind all of our meeting participants to use respectful language and uphold our values of cooperation, trust and openness. Uh, the order of proceedings is as follows. First, I'm going to ask the planner to explain the purpose of the application and hearing and to present staff report. Then we'll have the applicant or their agent um, speak to the application and then the public will be asked for their comments and questions. Members of the public, please ensure you state your name and record, uh, name and address so that comments can be reflected in the minutes. Uh, then I'll look to the committee to ask questions of the applicant and or staff. And finally, then I'll ask for um, us to consider the motions regarding the applications that we've been hearing. So moving to item 10.1. We have Mary Cabral, uh, County Pan Planner, uh, providing a, an overview of the report for this application. Great, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. And I'll just quickly share my screen to bring up a location map for the first application. Um, so I will provide information regarding an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment for property uh, located at 10432 Melrose Drive in the former township of Lobo. The purpose of these applications are to redesignate the lands from agricultural to an agricultural special policy area and to rezone the lands to a site specific agricultural zone in order to permit a second single detached dwelling, a home occupation in an accessory structure with outdoor storage, and to permit a home occupation in a detached structure that exceeds the lesser of 25% of the floor area of the dwelling or 40 square meters. So the subject lands are approximately 10 acres in area and located just north of an urban area of Kilworth and located on the north side of Melrose Drive and east of Coldstream Road. The lands contain two single detached dwellings, one that is leased and is located closer to Melrose Drive. And there is a second uh, dwelling located in the center of the property, which is now occupied by the landowner. The applicant has also indicated a storage barn or a shed located on the northwestern portion of the property that is used for the business of Walker Construction. Land surrounding this barn are also used by the business for trailer storage and outdoor parking of vehicles or trucks. So the lands are not actively farmed um, as uh, advised by the applicant and their agent and contain grassed areas and a pond as well as significant woodland as you can see on the map. Um, in the eastern portion of the property, which is also regulated as well. Um, the applicant is not proposing to construct any new buildings or expand the area dedicated to the business, but they are simply applying for the redesignation and the rezoning to permit the existing uses on the land and to validate those uses. So the agent and 
Applicant have advised that the business has existed on the land since 1998 and provide excavation, paving, septic installation, haulage, and uh, demolition services for the construction industry. The business uses of the property uh, for sorry uses the property for storing of materials, equipment, uh, vehicles, and the maintenance of vehicles as well. Additionally, there is an office for the business, which is located in the single detached dwelling where the landowner resides. Uh, so the app, uh, agent has advised that approximately one to three employees are on the lands during the working week and uh, that uh, they have existed since uh, the time that business was um, uh, commenced on the property. Uh, the dwellings were uh, constructed in 1955 and 1988 respectively. However, the agent or the owner has not indicated if the second dwelling is a legal non-complying building. Additionally, the landowner is not aware of any site plans that are registered to the property related to the business. So again, the landowner is not proposing any new buildings or dwellings and the applications are a result of the non-compliance with municipal bylaws, including the zoning bylaw. The applicant has provided um, has been provided with the option to remove the uses completely for the lands or to seek approval from the municipality by way of an amendment to the zoning bylaw and official plan to validate those uses on the land and allow them to stay. So planning uh, staff note that the amendments reflect two, prop uh, sorry, two issues on the property. So first is the business and the second is a second uh, single detached dwelling. Uh, related to the business, the uh, provincial policy statement, the county official plan and Middlesex Center official plan generally support home occupations where they are limited in scale and secondary to the main use of the dwelling or the agricultural um, use on the lands. Additionally, the agricultural area generally permits agricultural uses, agriculturally related uses, or on-farm diversified uses, subject to specific criteria, including the scale and size of the operation. Uh, planning staff initially reviewed uh, the operation from the perspective of an, an on-farm diversified use. However, upon review of OMAFRA's guidelines and assessment of the property and business, it could be determined that the operation is not limited in scale, nor is it located on a farm, an active farm, which it is secondary to. The applicant has applied to recognize the business as a home occupation with outdoor storage. And a home occupation can be considered, uh, per the zoning bylaw definition, as an occupation secondary to a residential use conducted for profit or gain and located entirely within the dwelling unit. Um, and that dwelling unit is uh, uh, owned by uh, a resident of the property and not more than uh, one assistant who does not uh, reside in the dwelling is allowed as a, associated with the uh, home occupation. The zoning bylaw then goes into detail um, what may be considered a home occupation and what may not be. And this includes a service shop, storage yard, parking area, or any site uh, of the buildings for land, sorry, for building or construction trades. So the county also recognizes that home occupations can be located on agricultural areas and they are generally contained within a dwelling unit that can be located within accessory buildings. A home industry may also be considered where it is located in a shed or a farm building and have up to three employees. A uh, home industry in this sense is to be accessory to a residential use or to a farm use and to have screened and small scale outdoor storage and have no impact to the natural system as well. The local official plan for Middlesex Center permits home occupations on agricultural lands. However, they are to be clearly secondary to the agricultural use and no outdoor storage is permitted. Uh, and finally, the zoning bylaw for Middlesex Center and the previous zoning bylaw for the Township of Lobo permits home occupations on the subject lands. However, the zoning bylaw provides more detail of the size and scale of these occupations and state that it should be located entirely within the main dwelling. So the second issue on the land is the permission of the secondary detached dwelling unit. And this is not to be confused with a secondary unit or an additional residential unit. Uh, this is a second single detached dwelling that's located on the property. So the provincial policy statement is supportive of housing options such as secondary units. However, they are intended to be secondary or subordinate to the main dwelling and smaller in size. 
The county official plan contemplates up to two farm residences on an agricultural lot, provided that the second farm residence is a temporary residential unit. An example of this would be a residence for seasonal farm help, for example, but it's not intended to be a permanent solution. Uh, the local official plan for Middlesex Center also permits a principal farm residence, which can be converted into two separate units, or it permits a converted dwelling. Um, accessory residential units can be contemplated in detached structures, provided they are secondary or accessory to a main dwelling, and this is in conformity with the Planning Act and the PPS related to secondary units. The uh, Middlesex Center official plan also states that non-farm residences, which existed prior to the establishment of Middlesex Center, which was January 1st, 1998, may be used, altered, reconstructed, repaired, or renovated, provided that the reconstruction, repair, or renovation is undertaken in full compliance with the applicable law. And finally, the zoning bylaw for Middlesex Center considers only one single detached dwelling or converted dwelling or and breakfast established on each lot. So notice that these applications were circulated to agencies and area residents in accordance with the Planning Act. At the time of writing my staff report, I did not receive any comments from the public. However, I did receive phone calls from um, members of the public who have concerns with the existing business specifically. There are concerns like to the noise um, coming from the business and the operations, um, including like trucks backing up and using the property. Uh, the hours of operation, fumes and odors from the operation and on-site fires, uh, possible contamination of groundwater and soils due to the septic tanks um, and the sketch that was provided by the applicants. There are, uh, I believe it was three um, septic fields located on this property. Um, the area resident is also concerned about the storage of fuels, uh, paved parking areas and maintenance area and the storage of any other hazardous material materials or noxious materials on the site. Um, the residence is also concerned that the business is too large and may grow and occupy the entirety of the lands and question how many businesses or contractors are on the property and if this uh, conservation authority or municipality has reviewed the construction of the berm on the property and if there's any impacts to the significant woodland. Uh, so by law enforcement and building staff provided uh, concerns in the letters provided to the applicant in January and May 2020 and this is as a result of uh, non-compliance with the zoning bylaw and other municipal bylaws. Uh, Public Works and Engineering do not have any concerns with the application um, and plain staff reviewed the applications with the agent prior to submission. So the nature and of the business and the overall operation can be considered a contractor's yard or shop. And per the zoning bylaw definition, this is inherently an industrial use. Planning staff continue to direct these types of uses to settlement areas like Globo, Melrose, or Kamoka, or on pre-zoned properties for industrial uses that may exist along Egremont Drive or along Woods Row. Um, staff also review the housing policies and know that there is support for additional residential units, especially where they are secondary and accessory to the main dwelling and sharing services or cluster to the main dwelling. So in this case, uh, the two residences are separated from each other and not clustered. The residential unit should also limit the impact on agricultural areas and prevent any opportunities for further severances. So as mentioned, uh, this report is to provide information to the public and council and solicit feedback at a future date, which is yet to be determined, staff will provide a recommendation to council. And I'll be happy to answer any other questions at this time. Okay, thank you for that presentation, Marion. Um, okay, no one is, no one is here. Um, so, uh, members of asking about the public hearing, so I'm just not going to speak to anybody. Okay. If there are members of the public attending the meeting virtually who would like to comment on this application, please use the raise hand feature now. Okay. So no members of the public have registered and neither has anyone raised their hand to indicate their wish to speak now. So we can now um, look to councillors for questions. Go ahead, Councillor Arts. Through, <clears throat> excuse me. Through you, Madam Mayor Tamarian, I just want to repeat, this, this, this is going to come up on more applications tonight. 
and they're still confused and we're receiving this report for information only. We're not approving any bylaw changes. This is just an information gathering meeting. I, I know Marion's already stated that and I thought I would state it one more time because there is confusion on this and I, I hope that gives everybody some clarity. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And Councillor Heffernan has indicated I wish to speak. I see you there. Yes, through the mayor to Marion. Um, so is it possible those two dwellings are there because the two properties merged at some point in time? Um, and so, you know, we sort of be probably wasn't done uh, properly at the time. That's what I'm thinking for the two properties. Um, the other thing I'm concerned with is home occupation. I think you, um, you, you stated the details. It's just that you're kind of fading in and out on my computer, so I couldn't hear it all. But um, I think a home occupation is more in the house, if I heard you correctly. And this occupation is more of an industrial type occupation. Uh, through you, Madam Mayor, to Councillor Hefner and the rest of Council. So to answer your uh, your first question, the applicant hasn't uh, addressed or stated if it was a result of a merger um, for the parcels um, coming together, and that's the result of the two dwelling units. Um, from my understanding, the landowner had acquired the property as it is today, so they acquired the full 10 acres and are unaware of what may have happened in the past. So it, it could be a possibility, but we're just unsure at this time. And then with regard to the home occupations, that is correct. Um, planning staff have also indicated that to the agent before applying that we do consider this um, a contractor's yard or shop, which we consider an industrial use and we would not permit it within an agricultural area should a new application were to ever come forward. We would definitely direct those types of uses to industrial zones or even some commercial zones. Thank you. Anyone else? Councillor Cates? Through you, Madam Mayor, <clears throat> pardon me. Um, I don't know if it's to Marion. I, I, I know tonight it's for information only and we're not voting. I just, you know, when I read through all of the, all of the pages about this, I just couldn't help but think, you know, he's lived there since 1998, 23 years probably in business. And he probably met the zoning bylaw uh, along the way. And, um, you know, we'd be taking away a house from the, the renters and, you know, forcing the business to move. So um, I, I guess I just, I just feel like I need to state that. Thank you. Thank you. Other comments or questions? Okay. Um, I'm told there are no more hands on screen either. So, um, we have a motion to receive for information and it reads that report PLA 82 2021 regarding official plan amendment number 56 and zoning bylaw amendment 14 2021 for the lands known as 10 432 Melrose Drive <coughs> be received for information. Uh, Mover, please, and a seconder. Councillor um, Shipley and Councillor Arts. All in favor? Okay, thank you. That is good. Um, Moving on now to item 10.2, which is zoning bylaw amendment on Longwoods Road. Again, Marion, it's your report. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. So the purpose of this report is to provide a recommendation to Council regarding a zoning bylaw amendment for the property located at 10915 and 10929 Longwoods Road in the former Township of Delaware. Uh, the purpose of this application is to place a holding symbol or the H2 holding symbol on the lands to prevent any development until a site plan is entered into with an sorry with individual landowners um, of the draft plan approved plan of condominium. The subject lands are located on the south side of Longwoods Road and east of Martin Road, and a plan of condominium was draft approved to create 15 vacant land condominium lots for future industrial development. Uh, the zoning does permit the uses and requires a noise impact assessment to be completed. However, it does not identify the need for a site plan agreement in accordance with the site plan bylaw for the municipality. So a site plan agreement ensures that individual development proposals on each lot are in keeping with municipal policies, bylaws and guidelines such as landscaping, uh, servicing and stormwater management. And the site plan approvals generally required prior to the issuance of any building permits for development. 
So notice that this application was circulated to agencies and area residents in accordance with the Planning Act. Um, staff did not receive any comments from the public. However, we did receive a phone call related to the servicing and storm order of the development. However, it was not related to uh, the holding symbol or this application specifically. Additionally, municipal staff uh, did not have any comments with the addition of the holding symbol. So staff considered this holding symbol appropriate as it ensures the implementation of mitigation me uh, measures from the noise impact assessment for each lot and can allow for the phasing of each lot compared to one site plan agreement for the entire development. Uh, the site plan agreement for each unit will also need to be in compliance with the overarching development clauses for the plan of condominium, such as servicing and stormwater management. So therefore staff are satisfied that a holding symbol is appropriate uh, tool to ensure orderly development of land and recommend that the holding symbol or the H2 be placed on the subject lands. I'll be happy to answer any questions. Okay, thank you for that presentation. And I um, be told that Carl McIntosh is present and he will be speaking on behalf of the applicants. Kyle, are you there? Oh, uh, sorry. Can you hear me? We we can hear you. Oh, uh, yeah. Sorry. We can about see that. you as well. Oh, thank you. Uh, my name is Kyle McIntosh. Uh, I work for MTE Consultants, and I'm here representing the applicants. Um, this is the third public meeting uh, so far for this development, and uh, we support the current uh, motion, which is strictly for the holding provision. I'd like to point out that. Uh, we are, um, the zoning for the development has already been approved and so has the draft plan of condo. So this is just a uh, formality for um, specifically just to go to, for site plan for individual blocks, uh, which we concur with. Okay, thank you kindly. And we also have Sharon Beaumont, a member of the public uh, who has registered to speak as well. Okay, Sharon, are you there? Yes, I am here. Okay, good evening. Uh, the floor is yours if you'd like to make your presentation. Um, the neighbors, our land is drained by a miscible drain at that um, land. And we're just worried about floodwaters backing into the land and the holding pond is it possible to put the storm water into the miscible drain instead of the holding pond? Yeah. Um, I think the best thing to do right now with your question, Sharon, is uh, make sure that it gets to our public works engineering people who are the experts in this. Um, we're actually looking at more for comments with respect to the planning as this is a planning meeting. Um, okay. But the, the clerk has your information, and um, I, if you run into any problems in reaching out, uh, staff will be happy to make sure help. We'll be happy to help you make sure you get in touch with the right person so you can get an answer to your question. Okay, thank you. Oh, okay, thank you. Good night. All right, and then um, I'm just going to ask again if there are members of the public attending virtually who would like to comment on this application, please re raise your. Um, hand feature now so we can bring you on. Okay, we don't see anyone at the moment. So um, the motion before us is that the direction by council to place a holding symbol that is H-2, which, uh, which the precondition for the removal of the holding symbol shall be a site plan agreement entered into with the municipality on the lands known as uh, 10915, 10929, and 1157 Longwoods Road, and legally known as concession one part lot six um, in the former township of Delaware, Middlesex Center be approved. Could I have a mover please and a seconder? Let me see, Council. 
Councillor Scott. Councillor Scott and uh, Deputy Mayor Brennan. All in favor? And that is carried then. Thank you very much, everyone. Uh, moving on to applications for plan of subdivision for Springer Street, item 10.3. And again, Mary, Marion, this is uh, your file. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. And again, I will share my screen just to bring up a location map for everyone. The purpose of this report is to provide information to Council regarding a zoning bylaw amendment and a plan sorry, plan of subdivision application for the property located at 45 Springer Street in Kamoka. The purpose and effect of the plan of subdivision is to create 10 lots along Springer Street and lots one to eight would accommodate a single detached dwelling on each lot and lots nine and 10, which currently consists of an existing single detached home, uh, would accommodate a single detached dwelling or semi-detached dwelling. So the purpose of the rezoning application is to create a site-specific urban residential first density zone for lots one to eight, as well as a new site-specific urban residential second density zone for lots nine and ten. All lots will have frontage and direct access onto Springer Street and would back onto the existing pond. The entire property is approximately 16.8 acres in area, however the proposed plan of subdivision only applies to the 2.3 acres which are highlighted in this uh, location map. So the applicant did apply for development across Queen Street and Glendon Drive as well, but has since scaled back on their proposal and is only seeking to develop the lands along Springer Street at this time. The lands are within the residential designation and currently zoned within the urban residential first density exception three zone. The existing pond and the abutting area around it is regulated by the Conservation Authority as well. So the applications were before Council in 2017. At that time, Council directed staff to bring forward a draft plan conditions with a recommendation and to establish an appropriate setback from the pond in cons consultation with the Conservation Authority. Uh, the, sorry, the proponent had also completed additional studies that were reviewed by the Conservation Authority as well. So the provincial policy statement, the county official plan, and the Middlesex Centre official plan are generally supportive of increasing the housing supply within urban areas designated for residential land uses where there is connections for full municipal servicing and in proximity to amenities, uh, the village centre areas and other services, as well as a high uh, uh, traveled road. Uh, however, any new development needs to have consideration for the regulated areas and ensure impacts from flooding or natural hazards such as erosion are mitigated to protect and the safety of the residents that may live there in the future. Since uh, some time has passed since that original public meeting in 2017, staff wanted to present the applications to council again and the public as well prior to making a recommendation. The proposed zoning for the proposed, um, proposed residential units uh, can be supported within the residential designation. However, the zoning needs to still be reviewed by the Conservation Authority to confirm the rear yard setbacks are appropriate considering the, um, the steep slope from the edge of the pond to the top of the uh, street level. Uh, notice of public or notice of the meeting was circulated to area residents and agencies as well. Um, Staff received a comment from a neighbor who has concerns with the continued ownership and management of the pond, uh, filling in of the pond, the water levels, erosion hazards, um, generally with the rezoning application and the intersection of London Drive and Springer Street being overloaded with additional traffic. Additionally, they had concerns about the studies that were provided by the applicant and the peer review of those studies and clarification of the intended use of that existing single detached dwelling. Uh, the municipality's uh, chief building official reviewed the applications and presented concerns with the conversion of the existing house. So just to clarify, the intent of the owner um, is to keep the house on the site, but subdivided either to create a semi-detached dwelling or to remove um, a breezeway and create two single detached dwellings. So the chief building official's concerns is that uh, they, they're, they're not aware or um, it's not known if that building can be converted into a semi or single detached dwelling, um, just given uh, you know, uh, becoming to standard with the Ontario Building Code. And uh, this matter can be addressed, addressed through the draft plan conditions or the zoning of the lots, but uh, staff would like to determine uh, what the outcome is prior to draft plan approval. 
The Public Works and Engineering Department did not provide comments at the time of writing this report. However, they have provided detailed comments uh, throughout the review of the engineering reports and leading up to this public meeting. As well, they have provided comments uh, that are now uh, draft plan conditions within um, the draft plan approval for the subdivision. So these conditions include the provision of servicing, stormwater management, and the reconstruction of Springer Street. Additionally, the county engineer reviewed the application due to proximity to Glendon Drive, and he has noted that the turning lanes at the intersection of Glendon Drive and Springer Street are sufficient to handle the additional nine units. Um, other agencies like Canada Post and the Railway also provided requests for draft plan conditions, which are quite standard for uh, plan of subdivision applications. So as mentioned, the purpose of this report is to provide information and public information to the public and to council as well and to solicit feedback at a future date which is yet to be determined staff will provide a recommendation to council and i'll be happy to answer any questions at this okay thank you um i'm going to now move to uh scott allen who has registered to speak for the applicant Oh, that's you. Okay, Mr. Allen, are you there? Scott? Yes, I, I am, Madam Mayor. Hi My there. apologies. Yep. That's okay. Um, we just want to make sure that you know we see your name. So the floor is yours if you'd like to make your presentation. Yes, and I'll be brief. Uh, good evening, Madam Mayor, members of Council. My name is Scott Allen. I'm with MHBC Planning, and we're acting on behalf of the applicant. With me uh, this evening, representing the project team is Brian Schneider, and he's available to respond to questions relating to project planning and the, pro uh, the proposed subdivision design. At this time, we'd like to provide a few brief comments to supplement Ms. Cabral's presentation and her planning staff report. At the outset, as set out in that report, several studies and peer reviews of the subdivision design have been completed following the, gen the January 2017 council meeting. We understand that completion of these assessments has satisfied the core technical issues identified by municipal staff and review agencies through uh, the initial review process. Additional discussions may be required between our project team and these agencies moving forward uh, and this will be confirmed with discussions with municipal staff. With respect to zoning, as Mr. Cabrell uh, discussed, the proposed zoning for lots nine and 10 is, of the draft plan have been uh, recently revisited, uh, as the intent is to separate the existing dwelling into two single detached dwellings rather than a semi-detached. In light of this going forward, uh, lot nine would be proposed to be zoned the same UR1 special zone that lots one to eight, uh, are being proposed for, and lot 10 being narrower would have a separate UR1 special zone that would have a minimum lot area of 600 square meters and a minimum lot frontage of 14 meters. Uh, these, these proposed uh, revisions have been uh, discussed with staff, and again, going forward, the intent is to um, rezone in that manner, and with that, semi-detached dwellings would not be permitted in the subdivision. We'd also like to advise uh, council that the applicant has reviewed the draft plan conditions included in the council package and is satisfied with the terms of those conditions. And finally, uh, as Ms. Cabral had mentioned, we're aware that neighboring residents have certain questions uh, and concerns relating to the subdivision design and project implementation. Our project team will review these concerns in consultation with municipal staff, and it's intended that uh, these outstanding issues will be addressed in the near future. So to conclude, in light of the comments provided by planning staff and our additional input, we respectfully request that council advance these applications for future consideration. Thank you, and we'll gladly answer any questions uh, council members may have. Uh, thank you for that. I'll look now to uh, Mr. Snyder. Oh, sorry. Mr. Snyder? Oh, sorry. oh okay, sorry. So Charlie Fowler is up next. Mr. Snyder is not present to speak.
Hello. Hello, Charlie. Would you like to make your presentation, please? Uh, for sure, I would. Um, thanks, um, Mayor and Council, for uh, listening to my concerns. Um, I'm just going to read a few notes I have here. Um, I'm pretty sure that Council has already read my letter concerning um, this project, so I'll just try to generalize some of my concerns. Um, my wife, Pat, and I have lived in the house right beside the proposed lots for over 26 years. Um, I believe we have a really good feel of the neighborhood and the community. Since we live right next door to the development, I'll try to speak to how it affects us directly um, for the most part. Uh, a big concern is with the filling in of the pond um, behind the lots closest to ours, which would be, I believe, lot, like lots one, two, three. Um, um, the property line between us and Mr. Snyder's property extends approximately 45 feet out into the pond behind our house. Um, that is according to the survey maps uh, supplied by Springer Pond Developments. Um, my wife and I own a little piece in the corner of this pond, um, part of the water. Um, part of Mr. Snyder's plan is to fill in the pond portion of the lots to extend and square them off with the new property line proposed in this application. Um, I don't see how this can be done without the fill filling in part of the pond that um, we own along the property line, which is roughly 45 feet out. Um, the pond's likely at least 10 feet deep um, when you go out 45 feet. So if you push that much fill um, out there into the pond, I don't know how that could be contained without spilling into our portion of the pond um, without like putting in some kind of god awful um, retaining wall or something like that, um, which would be a terrible eyesore. Um, I asked Mr. Snyder that question is at the last at his last application in 2017, but he didn't really have a solid answer other than maybe some Cambrian baskets or something. But um, so I don't even think he's um, thought about it since then. Uh, if the fill did partially fill in a portion, it would just end up looking like a little cesspool or puddle behind our house. Um, has Mr. Snyder submitted any plans with this application on how extending these lots so close to our property will be done? And um, I also worry if you were to fill and it was done too much too fast, Flooding the neighboring properties and basements could occur as well. Um, I'm hoping to get this done in five minutes. I'm speaking rather quickly. Uh, another major concern for me in the planning justification report, it says that the existing pond will become a, this is a very important to me, become a common element condominium. The report also says that an application for the condominium needs to be in place before the sale of any Springer Street lots. I want to know if any restrictions would be in place regarding the use of the pond, in particular, like power boats, jet skis that could compromise water quality, also be a noise issue. Um, because we do own a little piece of this pond, how, does this, how is this gonna impact me and my wife? Um, will we be included in this condominium? If not, how do we have any say in what happens on the pond? Um, has Mr. Snyder applied for this condominium yet? Um, past that, um, I think I mentioned in my letter um, to a council that the count, I, I think this may have partially been covered, but the county engineer stated that there is a turning lane at Glendon and Springer to um, facilitate traffic. Um, there's no turning lane there. I don't know where that comes from. And, um, I'm just wondering, has there been a current traffic study done in this area um, recently? Because my understanding is there haven't. So I don't know if this traffic stuff is based on like old information or not. Um, also in my letter to council, I touched on um, some, but not all of the comments by the Upper Thames River Conservation Authority and Stan Tech Consulting um, regarding the hydrogeological assessment. 
Um, of concern to me is the water table in some places being only 1.4 meters below ground level. Also numerous, there, there are, it, it's in the reports, there's numerous underground aquifers that all head towards the river. Um, they voice concern about basement and water, um, water sewer excavations and the possibility of major water issues when that's done. Has Mr. Snyder submitted a plan on how this will be achieved if he, if he runs into a major water problems or an aquifer? I believe these aquifers are part of our watershed through, through the municipality, um, like heading to the river, and they affect our stormwater management as well. Also, if this development were to go ahead, are there any bonds or assurances that Springer Pond Developments has to give to Middlesex Center? Based on based on the approval that Mr. Snyder had to sever and service um, a couple of lots on Queen Street not long ago um, that he failed to follow through with. Um, he got approval for those um, a couple of years ago. I worry that eight to 10 lots with complicated servicing may be too much. Um, I'd hate to see like a, a full block of Springer Street torn up for services um, and it's not completed in a timely fashion or maybe not completed at all. Uh, to finish up, um, I'm looking at Springer Pond Development's newest application um, with all those attachments and studies. It looks like the same old studies from 2017. Most of them are outdated. Um, it all looks like the same, just, just the same stuff and, and not too much has been addressed. Um, I see little to no progress um, with any of the concerns with which were brought up in these studies. There seems to be no solid plan in place on how he's gonna proceed. And I, I, I think he should have a plan in place and I think he should have taken these last four and a half, five years to um, come up with a solid plan for you guys on how he's gonna address all these issues that are in those uh, studies. Anyways, I, would, I just wanna thank council for um, taking our plans, or sorry, our concerns into consideration regarding this development and um, Thanks again for um, listening to my uh, little rant here. Uh, thank you and very much. I, I, I'm, I'm done. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for your input. Um, I'll look now to Mr. Uh, Rob uh, Taggart, who has also registered to speak. Good evening, Madam Mayor, Council. Thank you hello. for. Uh, hello. Yes, your your floor is yours. Go yep. ahead. Good evening, Madam Mayor, uh, members of Council. Thank you very much for uh, giving me a moment to uh, to put in some thoughts on the situation of the application. Um, I just, you know, I I, I heard Marion's uh, report. Um, listened to that. Uh, my concern after that is listening to the representative talk about a revision to the plan last minute uh, regarding a semi-detached moving to a detached home. Um, it speaks to a lot of the reports that that uh, uh, Charlie spoke to a, a few moments ago that appear incomplete, outdated. Uh, peer reviews have indicated that they're in a confusing manner. These are you know, peers that, that have the understanding of what these reports should contain. So uh, I'm concerned that we're going into this with uh, partial or minimal information that may be misleading or incomplete on making decisions and even moving forward with this. Um, so that's kind of the, 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 the underlyings of it. Um, I'm a bordering property. I, I hear what Charlie's saying. If we start filling in the pond, we, we may experience or could experience future uh, erosion to the bank. The banks are sloping, um, you know, quite significantly along the, the, the north shore of the pond. Uh, what's the backfilling impacts? What are we going to do to mitigate that? I don't see any plan in that place. Uh, Upper Thames River Conservation Authority has requested, and they don't see any sort of identification in any of the reports how that will be mitigated. Uh, you know, this has been an ongoing uh, application, you know, four or five, six years. I would think at that point in time, there would be the, uh, the, the studies completed, uh, the information available to bordering properties and council to confirm that uh, what they're proposing are will, will be 
within reason and safe and the boring properties don't have any risk mitigation in place or any risk mitigation that we would have to have. Um, with that thought in mind, I guess my question is along the lines of Charlie's question, was any sort of bonds or management uh, reserves that we put in place by Springer Pond Developments to ensure if there is some sort of a, an aqueduct issue um, where it does cause erosion or dewatering where we have underground erosion that we can't see at the moment. Uh, we had a situation in the north part of Kamoka where they were putting in new municipal services for three lots. I believe the road was tore up for about four months uh, while they tried to dewater and get the services into the ground. So um, again, that concern, it doesn't appear that any of this uh, fundamental study has been done prior to this application. So it really feels like a, uh, a very flimsy, uh, unsupported, just trying to get something in front of council at this point in time. Um, that's uh, my few minutes that I have. I won't take you, I won't take you down any more paths. I appreciate your time, council, and I will turn it back over to you. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Taggart. Uh, that is the list, the end of the list of people who registered to speak. I'm going to ask are any members of the public attending virtually who would like to comment on the apl application? If they are listening and want to speak, please raise hand, use your hand, raise hand feature now. Okay, hello, Mr. Knudsen. Uh, thank you, uh, Madam Mayor, uh, Madam Chair, and, and to the committee. I'm going if, to be very, I'm going to be if, very- If you could, just before you begin, please state your name for the record, as well okay. as your address. Uh, my name is Rick Knudsen, Knudsen Development Consultants, Inc. Uh, I'm a planning and development consultant, and I'm here on behalf of the Powells. And you'll hear me speak a little more a little bit later on, on our application. Um, this is just a very brief question I have through you to uh, um, walk through you to the to the committee. Uh, our our concern or our question resolves revolves around stormwater quality, and I believe these lots are proposed to be serviced by the stormwater uh, sewers on on Springer Street that go into the municipal system. That system works its way into the Powell Pond. Uh, the outlet is there. And we are concerned about stormwater quality. As I say that, we've been working with, uh, with Mary and, and Rob Cascaden uh, over the last number of months, and we're hoping to find an ultimate solution to the overall stormwater management questions. Um, we believe that this may be premature without stormwater quality answer being uh, being fulfilled. That's my question. Those are my comments. And uh, I'm happy to answer any further from the committee uh, to clarify that. Okay. Um, as a member of the public who's presenting, we've noted your question. Those were, it's not a debate or a conversation tonight. Um, so you're presenting your question. It's been noted. And, and unless you have anything to add, um, that would be yeah, You're, are you finished then? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Okay, all right. Um, there's no one else that's popped in? Okay, so at this point then I can turn to council. Um, your turn to ask questions or um, make comments on this application. Councillor Cates. <laughs> Through you, Madam Mayor, I have uh, <clears throat> many notes. Um, first of all, I want to thank everybody for all the calls and emails um, and, you know, expressing your concerns. Um, much appreciated. And uh, Charlie, that was a wonderful presentation. You really touched on a lot of things um, that I also have in my notes. So I am going to possibly repeat a couple, but um, so first of all, uh, I will say that I totally missed um, what the 
um, Mr. Schneider's planner said about the change in the in the last lot. So um, I'll just clarify that up front that I missed that part. Um, so one of the one of my first concerns is in the bigger picture of it all is the pond says common element. So I think that the pond plan should be taken care of first because uh, you know a com a common element to me means that people are going to pay a fee things are going to happen what if there is an issue in the pond um, where does all the responsibility lie we have a couple of examples of this in Kamoka already we have uh, one large pond that uh, has uh, 10 or 11 houses back onto it and that pond is actually a separate company and each of those people own a piece of it and they all vote on things and to my knowledge it goes very well. Um, we've had the issue in Bella Lago where all they have is a view and that was a problem from the start. People cutting down trees not on their, their property. Um, so I think that first and foremost a plan for the pond needs to be made. Um, um, and, you know, maybe it could include some some of the other neighbors as well, not just people that potentially buy some of these lots. So um, uh, another concern that I have is that the reports are very old and incomplete. I've written down here dates, the, the outline of the water's edge is from 1997. Um, there's 2016, there's a few things from 2013. So I think that there's some very old reports. Um, and there's some, some real concerns in the report uh, about the water levels and the stability and how much has that changed since these old reports. There's talk about um, drilling being required, um, extra deep foundations because of the high water table. Um, I think some more information is needed on that. Um, and for many reasons, I mean, above all the regular reasons, then if these were to be sold off to individuals and they're buying these and they don't even have any idea, I think there needs to be a much clearer plan. Um, I totally agree with Charlie uh, Fowlers as well on the filling in the shoreline. Um, you know, I read in the reports at one point there was talk of bringing a fill in and then um, there was a change of plans and what if you use one of the lots has big um, land that sticks into the pond, well maybe we'll just take that dirt and move it over there. Um, and so my thought is why even change or worry about the shoreline, why don't you make less lots and make them wider and so that the rear property line doesn't even touch on the shoreline. Um, and, you know, maybe you can facilitate a walking trail, et cetera. So, uh, you know, wider lots uh, would mean then that you could get your square, your square area that you need per lot um, and, and leave the shoreline alone. Um, as far as the house, when I very first read this, I thought that it was eight lots with eight like single family home lots and two lots would each have a semi detached, which I thought, okay, well that could address some housing needs, et cetera. But then as I read it further, it's, it, and it says that it's to turn the existing house that's there into what I would call a duplex, but a semi to have zero lot one. I am not, I'm not in favor of that at all. Um, and uh, uh, first and foremost, I think Marion addressed this, but first and foremost, it would need to have lots of inspections. Um, you know, the house was moved there years ago and the way it's sort of laid out, it even shows it on the plan. One person would get the house and the other person would basically have a garage. So, I mean, I think that A, you turn lot, uh, those two lots would be lot nine and 10 into one lot and just turn the house into a duplex or you tear down the house and have two more lots. Uh, so that's my input on that. I mentioned the very old report and I, um, I totally agree on the question of financial assurances. 
Uh, I mean, the last thing that we would want to have is a half complete project and, you know, no offense intended at all, but that the house that is there has been an incomplete project uh, for over the years um, is, and is in still in need of repair at this time. So, um, you know, this is a very large project that could also have some real ramifications of risk with the high water level that it runs into. So um, that was another important question was the financial assurances, um, are they handled? Um, and not to answer Mr. Uh, Knudsen's question, but it was a point that I had, I thought that I read that for now, the storm water would go into the pond and at a future time when there was a storm water, then it would be run to Glendon, which left me with the question of then who pays for that at the time. So um, I think that that's all my points. Thank you very much. I'll look to the councillors for, okay, Councillor Heffernan, I understand you have your hand up. <clears throat> Through the mayor, yes, I, I, um... I, first of all, agree 100% uh, with Councillor Cates's uh, comments and the speakers as well. Um, I, <clears throat> to start with, I was not clear how you're going to create two semi-detached um, houses out of on two lots and they're one building to start with. So Mr. Allen cleared it up that they are now going to have two separate houses on two separate lots. So that's okay. Um, the, the reports are dated. I was looking at some that I'm sure it said 1998. The Upper Thames report was from 2013. And um, there's a lot of things that could have changed in the interim. We've had different weather events, um, which could affect the aquifer and the stability of the slopes. So I think uh, updates to just about all these reports need to be done before we can proceed on anything. Um, the other thing is the, uh, the infill, from what I read, um, there's some confusion or concern with what exactly was going to be used um, in order to go to extend these lots so they're all the same size. Some of them would have to be extended five to 17 meters. Um, that's a lot of fill to put in um, just to square them up. So I like the idea of, of uh, making the lots wider. And um, one thing that's confusing, um, it was mentioned that Okay, they are individual lots. So I, my assumption would be they would be individual detached houses and they're on their own. Um, however, when common elements are mentioned, uh, it almost sounds like they are to be condo. So I guess we need clarification on exactly what it is that they're doing. Um, anyway, I just feel that there's a lot of questions on this. Um, the stability of the houses nearby, if, if all this fill has to go in and be compacted so that um, it, it's not going to break down in the future. Anyway, there's, there's still an awful lot of questions and I think some reports need to be updated. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Heffernan. Others? Okay, I guess it's my turn then. <laughs> I'm just going to raise anything that I haven't heard at this point that I'm still wondering about too. Um, I think it was Marion's report on page three. There's a reference to potable wells and survey of those. I'm not quite clear on what the results or why it was all undertaken and how it ties into the proposal that we're looking at now and um, what impact that might have on development or the neighboring homes. And implications of the hazard lands overlay on the pound. I'm not um, totally clear on what the implication of that is for residents or the pond or how that all fits in as well. And my semi-detached was answered. And I have questions about the condo too. So I think we've got enough questions about condos and how the applications and sales and ownership and risk and all that is spread out and what the form of that agreement looks like. So anyways, um, that's all I have to add. If there's nothing else, then I can look to council um, with the motion there's no one else, right? No one should. Okay. Yeah. So we are now um, done with the questioning piece and the motion before us is that the report uh, PLA 92 2021 regarding the post proposed plan subdivision file 39T 
uh, MC 0204 and planning zone, uh, pardon me, zoning bylaw amendment filed set EA 2017 for lands known as 45 Spring and Street be received for information. Uh, could I have a mover, please? And a seconder. Councillor uh, Cates and Councillor Heffernan. Thank you. All in favor? And that motion is carried. We can now move to application um, for a zoning bylaw amendment 12, 12 mile road. Um, and Marion, this is your file as well. If you'd like to provide the report, please. Great, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. The purpose of this report is to provide a recommendation to Council regarding a zoning bylaw amendment for a property located at 14176 12 Mile Road in the former Township of London. The purpose of this application is to rezone the lot with a surplus dwelling um, from agricultural to surplus residence and the farm parcel from agricultural to agricultural no residences to prohibit any new development or houses. The subject lands are located on the north side of 12 Mile Road and west of Richmond Street. The application is related to the conditionally approved consent application B23-2020, which had a condition to rezone the lands appropriately. The PPS, the county um, official plan, and the local official plans all permit severances of surplus farm dwellings. <coughs> The surplus farm dwellings provided that the farmland prohibits any new dwellings and that the residence is on a farm parcel is of minimum size needed to accommodate uh, the residents and any services associated with it. Notice of the application was circulated to agencies and area residents in accordance with the Planning Act. Staff did not receive any comments from the public and municipal staff have no concerns related to the rezoning. Uh, the Upper Thames Conservation Authority uh, did not provide any comments as well. So staff reviewed the application um, and the sketch of the draft plan provided by the applicant, noting the size and the frontage of both parcels, um, as well as the area and the setbacks of the buildings, and it appears to be consistent with both zones. As a result uh, of the above, staff recommend that the application be approved as the proposal is consistent with the provincial policy statement, the county official plan, and the Middlesex Centre official plan. And I'll be happy to answer any questions. Thank you for that. Um, there, the applicants did not register to speak. I'm just going to check and see, has anyone? No one has. And I'll make a call then. Are there any members of the public attending virtually who would like to comment on this application? If so, please use the raise hand feature now. And no one is uh, wanting to comment. So I will look now to council. Are there any questions or comments, concerns? I don't see any. The motion before us in that case is that zoning bylaw amendment application said BA 18, 2021, filed by Paul Willer on behalf of Margaret Corso for the severed and retained lands consent application B 2320 in order to imp implement the severance of a surplus farm residence be approved. Could I have a mover and a second? Councillor Shipley and Councillor Arts, all in favor. And that is carried, correct? Okay. All right, now we can move to um, item 10.5. And this is with respect to official plan amendment on the property at 22447 local vote. And that is yours as well, Marion, if you'd like to take it away. All right, thank you, Madam Mayor and Council. I'll just bring really quickly to provide a location map. And so the purpose of this report, again, is to provide information to Council and the public regarding an official plan amendment and zoning bylaw amendment applications for a property located at 22447 Kamoka Road in Kamoka. The purpose and effect of the official plan amendment and the rezoning applications are to redesignate a portion of the lands to medium density residential and to rezone to the urban residential third density zone in order to permit 152 dwelling units in two five-story buildings. The lands are approximately 14.6 acres in area and have frontage onto Kamoka Road. The lands are surrounded by agricultural lands uh, to the south as well as uh, former aggregate ponds. Uh, residential lands to the west and commercial lands to the north. The lands are on the southern boundary of the settlement area of Kamoka and designated parks and recreation and zoned restricted, sorry, restricted agricultural or the A2 zone. 
Uh, the applicant has only provided conceptual plans for the purpose of these applications, which are attached to my report, and it is subject to change. However, the applicant is proposing single access to Kamoka Road, as well as the two uh, apartment buildings, which will be oriented towards the ponds on the south. Um, generally, parking would be located on the north side of the development. Uh, the development proposal will be on full municipal servicing and stormwater management plans will also see use of the existing pond uh, located on the southern portion. Uh, details about the site development will be reviewed during site plan approval, which the applicant has not applied for yet. So again, this is just for the conceptual uh, permission of allowing this development to occur on the lands. Uh, generally, there is support in the provincial policy statement, the county official plan, and Middlesex Centre official plan for increasing housing availability, especially within urban areas where full municipal servicing is available, um, and lands that are in proximity to commercial areas, uh, open areas, and services. Um, the proposed development will also be located in a gateway location for the municipality, which is considered to have landmark features and importance to the municipality. Uh, there is also a consideration of the development uh, to hazard lands, especially where it is located in proximity to the pond, which is a regulated man-made feature um, that is used for stormwater collection, as uh, Mr. Knudsen had uh, identified in the last application. So the proposed rezoning application to the UR3 or the urban residential third density zone does not contemplate any site-specific standards based on the concept provided. Uh, and all uh, standards and the proposed development would need to comply with that zone. The public meeting was held for these two applications in 2019 and comments from the public meeting and council were received and included within my staff report. Uh, since uh, some time has passed since these applications were last before the public and council, staff had circulated a notice of this meeting to agencies and area residents. Uh, staff received comments from neighbors who have concerns with the compatibility between the buildings and the surrounding low density development, uh, the density of the proposed development um, in general, just in relation to other development within the Kamoka and Kilworth area. Um, there is concern about accessing uh, the commercial lands to the north, uh, usage of the lands by surrounding landowners for stormwater management. Um, the just to clarify, uh, the development, um, sorry, the residential development just to the west as well as lands to the north all uh, use this property to drain into the pond on the south side. Uh, there was also loss, um, concerns about loss of parkland as well as the additional traffic at the Glendon Drive and Kamoka Road uh, intersection. Uh, the Conservation Authority had provided comments in 2019 related to the hazard lands and the regulated area of the site. In general, the Conservation Authority does not have concerns with the proposed amendments. However, they do have concerns with the site servicing strategy and will seek confirmation of the setback between the pond and any proposed development. And this could be addressed through site plan uh, control. Uh, Public Works and Engineering reviewed the applications and have no concerns with these amendments. Uh, detailed comments on engineering matters, including stormwater and management of the pond, will be provided through the detailed design review of any development on the site. Uh, the county engineer reviewed the applications as well and does not have any concerns at this time. Again, additional comments will be provided at the time of site plan review for any proposed development, and generally they will seek uh, just a single access onto Kamoko Road, which is a county road. Um, additionally, the fire chief had also provided general comments related to new um, medium or higher density development within the municipality. So it's not specific to this site, but just a general comment about some of the uh, development applications that we're starting to see. Uh, generally, a few low to medium rise density um, developments, such as apartment buildings like this, will not impact the fire department's ability to suppress fire um, or hazards with the current equi equipment. Additionally, the Ontario Building Code has also designed and structural safety features that are built in and incorporated into any buildings, which also assist with fire suppression. So again, um, this purpose of this report is to provide information uh, to the public and to council and to solicit feedback. And at a future date, which is yet to be determined, staff will provide a recommendation to council. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this. Uh, thank you, Marion, for the presentation. Um, uh, Rick Knudsen, uh, who we just met, has registered to speak for the applicant here. Are you still available there?
There, I, I finally caught up to you. <laughs> there we go. Uh, go ahead, sir. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Um, my name is Rick Knutson, Knutson uh, Development Consultants, Inc., and my office is in St. Mary's. Uh, I thank you to Mary, and then Mary and I have had discussions over the last number of months uh, regarding this, and a couple of the questions have been answered, but uh, there are many questions still left to go, and uh, we would anticipate, uh, unless there is a full site plan to, to have discussion on, that there would be an H2. Uh, I can tell you that the building is going to change. What was originally designed was just a, an apartment building. By way of my background, uh, and I've been doing this for almost 50 years and uh, just about ready to retire. Um, a couple of years, uh, I spent working on five projects with a company called Amica. Uh, they're out of BC and they uh, worked on projects in London, Thornhill, uh, Newmarket, Whitby, and Kingston. Through working with Amica, I did learn a lot about what is needed for senior residences and senior apartments, and they're two very different, two very different things. This is a senior's apartment, and it would be based on a model of one bedroom and a den, a uh, small kitchen, uh, living area, uh, obviously bedroom. And uh, there would be a club room on the top floor that would be overlooking the pond on each building. And in the club room, it's important that this would be a, a community run function room, uh, whether it be dances, whether it be movies, whether it be dart boards or pool table, tabletop shuffleboard, activities that uh, seniors most importantly enjoy. The biggest asset of, of a senior uh, uh, building location is the, is the natural amenity. Folks sometimes just want to sit and look out on something that is enjoyable and that pond certainly provides all of those answers. The, uh, as far as location related to uh, Glendon Drive, uh, that's a standard planning uh, designation for normal townhouse development that would be adjacent to and, and protect the single family homes behind it, uh, adjacent to the where the medium density is adjacent to the uh, um, arterial road. Uh, Mary did speak and, and we did talk about uh, eliminating the proposed, the originally proposed access onto uh, the commercial, uh, commercial site. Uh, in favor of a single access over onto uh, the Collector Road, uh, Kamoka, Kamoka Road. Um, I can tell you that the planning report that is on the file prover um, provided by Mr. Curtis, and I've spoken to him about this, I absolutely um, endorse those recommendations and, and what he did. The only change that's happened that since he wrote that report is that the provincial policy statements have been upgraded to a 2020 version. Uh, nothing substantive changes relative to this particular project. Uh, it's important to note that there's some history here and, and this is not a new application as, as Marion stated. Uh, it, state, it started back in 2019. Um, as you all will probably Remember, my client's been involved in this general property since he acquired it in 2004. Uh, since then, um, the uh, Tim's was, was approved and the Little Beaver across the street opposed that. Um, Bella Largo was approved and people opposed that. And this is the last piece in that uh, development pattern. Uh, it's there, it's a fairly substantial piece of land and appropriate for the two apartment buildings, more appropriate than any other form of residential development, in my opinion. Um, a few more comments. Um, I mentioned stormwater, stormwater management, and Marion did specify that Bella Lago, um, the commercial, uh, and the municipal sewers um, are all tributary to this pond. Uh, Belo Lago has a, um, a storm sector, so that they do have some quality control. It's unknown as to whether or not that's managed on an annual basis. 
Uh, the commercial also have a storm sector and they have some quality control. If needed and necessary, the apartment buildings could proceed forward on the same way. Just a very general comment on stormwater and uh, Mr. Cascaden has been very, very helpful over the months as we've had many discussions and, and he's gone off to provincial authorities and had other discussions. We want to work with you to find a solution to this overall problem. We, we know that there are solutions and uh, we're happy to work with, uh, with Rob and, and we will find a, a cooperative and, and happy solution at the end of the day. Um, as far as seniors are concerned, the, or the buildings will be a little smaller footprint, I believe. Uh, there, are two, there are three types of seniors. And there's the go-go's, the slow-go's, and the no-go's. The uh, residential units would be proposed for the first two, for the first two, those that are active and those that are slowing down from being active. But uh, like myself, probably our heels are dug in. We don't want to go to the slow-mo just yet. Um, th this is, is not a nursing home, uh, isn't intended as such. And uh, uh, as you likely know, nursing home care is, is when there's uh, care provided at uh, more than 90 minutes per day, and that requires a license. Um, I mentioned the club room. Uh, the asset of the pond uh, for, for birding walking, um, the adjacent restaurants, Kim's, uh, the variety store provide the majority of, of the needed commercial functions necessary. Uh, Foodland, I believe, is about 1.03 kilometers away. And I don't know whether this community would have a bus that could uh, bring a number of people to do their shopping. That's not an unusual thing. Uh, we have a thing called Easy Care in uh, in St. Mary's that uh, will pick up many seniors and take them to their through their shopping. Um, the uh, municipal recreation complex also is is the uh, same distance away, and uh, again provides uh, a whole array of of recreational opportunities in very close proximity. Uh, Mary did mention the gateway function in your official plan. Uh, this will certainly assist in, uh, in providing a landmark, uh, a landmark feature. Also in your official plan is a multi-use trail system that crosses the northern section of this property. Again, that would be accommodated through the site plan approval process. So any rezoning without uh, a read on site plan would, would nece of necessity have a, an H2 or a uh, um, site plan approval precondition uh, for holding. Those are my general comments, Madam Chair. I'm absolutely happy to answer any questions that you, you and the committee might have. Uh, I believe that there have been a number, oh, sorry, I do have a couple of other comments. Uh, there's been a lot of information circulated in the neighborhood that seems to be misunderstood or, uh, well, I'll leave it at misunderstood. I spoke to the history of the, of the property. And again, this is the last of a, of a larger piece that has gradually developed. Um, Bella Lago was developed and it's adjacent to and overlooks the ponds, uh, a, a different pond. Uh, we're proposing that, that our development have that same overlook feature on this pond. Um, there is no loss of green space. This is privately held lands and they were designated park and recre or recreation. Um, undoubtedly as a holding designation, um, post the, um, the excavation activities. Uh, this is now, it's in private ownership, and this is, as I say, the last piece uh, post-excavation that uh, they can exist. Uh, understand the Upper Thames Conservation uh, comments, and they'll undoubtedly be a commenting agency on the, uh, on the um, site plan when it comes forward. As far as privacy is concerned, the existing, the existing channel uh, that, that provides uh, stormwater outlet to the uh, uh, to Bell Lago 
is, is 70 meters inside this property. That isn't going to change. These buildings will all be substantially further away than that. So privacy will not be an issue in my opinion. And, um, and we've agreed to uh, uh, delete the road, direct road connection to the commercial lands. Those are my comments, Madam Chair, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. Um, at this point, it's the public's turn. Uh, the first person who's registered to speak is Chris Dell, and he is on the line, is my understanding, or on the screen, pardon me. Right. Can you hear me? Sorry. Uh, just yes, to, yeah. yeah, thank you. So yep, thanks. The floor is uh, yours. <laughs> thank you, Madam Chair. Um, just want to clarify, as it uh, wasn't clearly stated, that over 80, about 80 uh, people have actually sent in a petition actually opposing uh, this proposed uh, development, not because it's seniors, but what it is and where it's located. So the reason being is most of the people in the Bella Lago uh, estates actually purchased their property to have uh, a rural village experience. Many of us come from London or other cities like Toronto and wherever you look, there are apartments all over the place and we were looking for a location to have quality life in a rural village environment. So that's really what's uh, the concern by many of the land uh, property owners of Bella Lago Estate. The other thing is, uh, you know, just looking at the character and looking at the previous uh, strategic plan uh, that was uh, purported for uh, Kamoka, when you look at the, the uh, aerial picture, you've got so many privately owned ponds, it, it's actually a feature of this particular strategic corner. So the question is, and uh, listening to the comments about the Springer development, um, is are we setting precedence by uh, developing what were gravel pits that were filled with water now for um, medium or even uh, residential property? What does it do to the environment? Have we actually got an independent assessment as to the impact to the underground and surface water if that is allowed to happen. So there are concerns there. Strategically looking at the, uh, the area, if you look at uh, that corner, it's actually a very welcoming corner with single uh, uh, re uh, uh, commercial properties with one double story. And in Bella Lago, I think there's one or a couple of uh, residences that are double story, but the rest are single level. Um, Having a five, two five-story apartments just doesn't seem to fit the characteristic of this welcoming corner, which is strategic to Kamoka. The other concern, of course, is the infrastructure. Despite what they say about the, the fire regulations, um, I still raise that as a concern. There's no walk paths. Uh, in actual fact, the infrastructure is not fully developed to cater for the type of volume that uh, is being proposed for this property. That being said, we just appeal to the council, please, re uh, please, when you're looking at this, think about the outcome as once it's built, then it stays. But if it's vetoed, could this property not be utilized more fruitfully to uplift and make the area more welcoming? So those are just the few comments I'd like to put to the council before they vote. And thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much. Uh, our next public um, attendee is Rod Lucier. Lucier. Hi, thanks for uh, for taking my call, and uh, I just want to I just want to take you on a little bit of a, a tour of this area. This is kind of a uh, it's it's a neat spot that we live in. Um, 
this is this is kind of the village that we're talking about and these ponds that are public areas yeah they're they're kind of special um but if you actually come in and walk around in this area you'll see that uh, uh it, putting a five story building in this place is not going to have a positive impact just, i can't drag my little guy there let me try one more time come right there so this is the this is the land that we're we're talking about um, this coming up. This is sort of what we're talking about developing. This little corner right here, putting a five story building, a couple of five story buildings for, with a hundred some parking spots in this area right here. This is the corner that's been developed. There's lovely gas stations, and and uh, this is actually on Google Earth. This particular part of the the um, screen is actually a few years old. But it, it's it's kind of a lovely spot to hang out and to live. Um, and there's not large buildings anywhere on route out here. It's a uh, it's a pleasant area to walk. It's a pleasant area to drive. It's a it's it's a manageable little community. And from this point of view, imagine on the horizon here a five story building. Imagine two five story buildings there. It's going to completely change this whole community. It's it's not going to be um, a lovely little village. It's going to be a central hub with a whole lot of traffic. Um, it's, it's just not going to be, and, and the speakers that spoke, I, I just, there's one other place I should bring you just for a second, because um, Mr. Knudsen talked uh, really nicely about having a nice place to look and no doubt ha being, being on the fifth floor overlooking those ponds would be really, really nice. I, I, I mean, I, I would love to go and visit and, and, and hang out there as well. But just down the road here, I'm just going to take you on a little walk down Kamoka Road. Um, it's not very far. You come to the main intersection. I know you, you folks probably know this community quite well. But just past this particular railway crossing is a senior's residence. Now, me, if I'm a senior, this is what I want. I want a place outside my senior residence, like these people in Kamoka Apartments have, where you can have your grandchildren over and run around and kick a soccer ball or do something active outdoors. We're missing green spaces in our communities. We have a few, like I can walk a few kilometers to the, the, the places in Kamoka that I can find some green spaces, but we need this. We don't need towers for people to go and live inside towers and to stand atop the towers to look at the wonders that surround us. We need to save the space we have. The previous speaker mentioned really smartly that once you build something huge in that space, it's there for generations. People won't be, you won't be able to pay millions of dollars to create a parkland like this. It's kind of unfortunate in my way of thinking that the land is actually come into private ownership. I kind of think it would have been nice had it been um, had it been kept as a, a community thing that that maybe it could be bought. Maybe someone on on council would say, "Hey, we could we could buy this from the people who want to develop and put cement there. We could buy this from them and put park in there. We could put places for people to go and cherish their time on Earth on the Earth." I don't know if you're aware of this, but that area, if you look at it from the sky where all the ponds are in that, it's a major route for navigate for geese that are flying, for all kinds of birds and, and wildlife, including butterflies of all different sorts, uh, animals that, that live and travel through here. You're throwing up a five-story building in front of there to bring seniors a place to stand and look over the ponds. To me, it's not a wise decision. I think it's, it's short-sighted. And my hope is that as a committee, um, you'll use your wisdom and make a decision not based on what's best for the developers wanting, but consider what the people, what's best for the quality of life for the people that live here, what's best for the animals in nature that live here, what's best for the traffic and people that pass through our community, instead of what's best for the developer. I hope that everything can be considered. I appreciate your time. and. Uh, I've been following this for a couple of years, seeing uh, that it's come forward again. I just thought I have to come and say something. So thanks again for the time. Thank you. And uh, Mr. Lean, John Lean, uh, you're, you're up next, please.
Hello, everyone. Hello, uh, the floor is yours, sir. Oh, that's great. Thanks. Hi, uh, my name is John Lean. I'm the owner of Lupine Properties Limited. I own the commercial uh, property uh, would be just to the north of the proposed development. That's where the Little Beaver restaurant is. Um, so to get straight to it, I think I heard Mr. Knutson say that they have, uh, they're dropping the proposal to include an access from their property onto mine, which I wasn't sure how that was ever going to work anyway. Uh, but that takes care of a, a big part of my, uh, my concern and comment. I'm wondering how that can be uh, recorded somehow. Uh, maybe I can ask Marion about that uh, tomorrow. But if that's somehow um, recorded and that's going to stand when they go do their site plan, um, then that's fine with me. That, that's very important that that connection not be made and that the access be on to Kamoka Road. Otherwise, you're going to have a mess. Um, so that's that. The second uh, thing that I wanted to talk about, which I wrote in my letter in comments, was the uh, we, Mr. Knutson's right, the commercial properties, myself and also the, the gas station, Tim Hortons, our stormwater goes into those lands. And um, I haven't seen any kind of uh, report or comments. Um, uh, I just don't know how the, the stormwater is going to be accommodated. Um, I believe I also have an easement over, uh, well, I do have an easement over the, the subject lands to drain stormwater. So um, yeah, if a holding provision goes on, you know, I'd just like to see some kind of evidence that uh, the stormwater is gonna be accommodated. Um, the third thing really is just regard the, uh, the, the amount of parking that's on the site. It looks a little bit short to me, but I'll leave that to, uh, to council and to planning uh, staff to, uh, and, I'll, and I'll trust their judgment on that. And, and I guess we can look at the site plan when that, when that comes down. Those are all my comments. Okay, thank you very much. Um, our next resident is um, Anna Teves or Teves? Teves? I'm sorry if I pronounced your name incorrectly. It, uh, you're up, Anna. Oh, hello. Good evening. Hello. Good evening. <laughs> so my name is Anne Teves. I'm here with my husband, Ricardo Teves, as well. Um, oh. We are the property owners at Unit 202-9861 Glendon Drive. In Bella Lagos. Um, in Bella Lagos. And these are just our comments that we have prepared for this evening. Um, so we are here today to voice our concerns over this proposed development. Our home that backs on to the proposed development is currently... Sorry. It's currently being built and much to our surprise when we purchased the lot and saw the stormwater sewers back there it never crossed our minds that something of this proposed grandeur would even be considered. In fact, being zoned for parks and recreation, we assumed it will one day be a green space for the community. We're not here to stand against development. Communities need to grow. But this proposal is for two five-story buildings. Why the need for something so big and so dense in such a small area? And when comparing our community to other communities of similar size, we have failed to come up with examples of structures in similar size. We have taken the time to review the reports that are available online, but those reports have only led to more confusion for what the proposal is. Will the buildings be situated against the gas station plaza closer to Kumoka Road with approximately 112 units, or will they be closer to our condo community on an angle with a garbage area and a 160 car parking lot right in the corner of our backyard? Will it be a retirement residence or is it being proposed as a retirement residence with the potential of the purpose being changed later down the road? We see this proposal as having a negative impact on our community. The increased growth in the Kilworth Kamoka area is already straining the roadways. roadways. What measures will be put in place to ease the pressures of the Glendon Kamoka intersection? This proposal stands to put a minimum of 112 cars daily into this intersection with no public transportation to help that alleviate that congestion. There's also an issue of incomplete or non-existent sidewalks. As it currently stands, you cannot safely walk from the proposed site to the commercial area that holds our local grocery store. Do we have adequate fire safety support in case a fire breaks out? And what about the environmental impacts to the pond and wildlife? I encourage you to take a walk along the park, uh, sorry, along the pond and experience the wildlife that currently resides there. Speaking on a personal level, 
Um, we obviously have a vested interest in that if this proposal is approved, it will have a negative impact on our property value. But something that you can assign a dollar figure to is that it will have a negative impact to our quality of life. Will we end up with a 160 car parking lot in our backyard? Parking lots are busy. Busy means noise. Parking lots also need to be lit. Will we end up with lampposts in the backyard? We have, as you can hear, small children. If it's 2 a.m. and car alarms are going off in this said parking lot, who do we call? The owner of the vehicle won't hear a peep because they'll be hundreds of feet away sleeping soundly in their five-story apartment. Parking lots also have the potential to attract crime. There's a walkway that connects our condo development to the proposed site. Will there be added concerns for increased in crime in our community? How does this impact the capacity of law enforcement? In one of the site plans, there's a proposed garbage area against our fence. What kind of smells will we have to deal with on those hot summer days? How much unwanted wildlife will this garbage area attract? Finally, how will the storm water infrastructure impact us? From our understanding, there are storm sewers that feed from the Bella Lago community into this pond. What impact would that construction have to us and our community? These are just some of the questions and concerns that we have. Some of them you may think are petty, some of them you may think are irrelevant, but this will be our home that we chose with purpose. The purpose to escape the chaos of the city, the purpose to bring our kids closer to the nature the community has to offer. Had we known what we know now, those decisions had would have certainly been made differently. So we understand and appreciate how elusive a development like this would be from a monetary perspective, but we just hope that you can understand on a compassionate level the impacts this proposal has on its neighbors who would rather see the land be used to serve this community as a whole. So thank you for your time. Thank you for that thorough and timely. <laughs> I'm watching the clock for everyone because I have to make sure we stay on track. So uh, thank you for that. Thank you. And now we move to Mike Park, please. Hello. Mr. Park? Yes, I'm here. Yes, it's your turn to speak. Thank you. I've heard a lot of great comments so far. Thanks very much uh, to everybody for uh, listening. Uh, you can hear the passion clearly from the uh, previous presenters, the, the public. It's not a big surprise then that, uh, as Chris mentioned, there's over 80 people that have already signed a petition. Uh, given the short notice, relatively short notice, uh, my guess is and sense is there would be a lot more that would sign the petition if we even had time to circulate it a little bit further. Now, we purchased our, our estate home in Belo Lago in December of last year. And at that time, we specifically asked the, the, re, the uh, realtor whether there were any other large or significant developments that were going to, going to be going in here. And we were told, no, not that they're aware of. Clearly, they forgot about the 2019 uh, submission the applicant made. And so it was a little disappointing, obviously, to see that uh, as uh, Rod mentioned, the beautiful community that we currently have uh, has the potential now to be changed significantly by the erection of two five-story uh, senior residence homes. I guess I'm gonna go back to the, the official plan of the community. And I, I, the way I look at it is the focus should be on the hub of the community, which is the wellness center. And I also understand there is uh, medium residential uh, density planning for around the resident, the, uh, wellness center. So I guess my question would be not that this is uh, a wrong, wrong development to have, but perhaps the wrong place to have it. Uh, the wellness center and the proximity to the shopping there, including Foodland, would make a great deal more sense than over here. And you've already heard some of the comments that have been made with respect to lack of sidewalks, the intersection at Glendon and Kamoka, um, uh, stormwater runoff, etc. You know, we, we talk about this also being part of a community gateway. Well, what value does the council put on municipal parks, open space areas, municipal trails and walkways? Those are all very valuable to us. And one of the reasons why the people who bought in the Belo Lago Estates area purchased where we did. Uh, having the nice pond in the back is certainly nice. So I can understand why the applicant would be interested in, in building where they, where they are proposing to. But again, it, as Rod mentioned, it, it's not, I'm not gonna call it an eyesore, but I guess I just did. Uh, it's something that is definitely gonna change the, the landscape of the Kamoka area and certainly shift the, uh, the hub from the wellness center 
perhaps over to uh, behind the, the Little Beaver and, and uh, Tim Horton. So that, I guess my question would be, is that the, uh, part of the official plan? And if so, um, I think we should have probably found out a little bit more about that uh, earlier. I wish we had, obviously, before we, before we purchased here. From a privacy perspective, obviously, selfishly, we're, we're all buying uh, on, uh, from an estate perspective, uh, fairly significant homes, retirement homes. And so this is kind of like the last resting post. So uh, I understand the applicant talking about uh, finding places for seniors that also want something similar. Uh, but yeah, for, for us, if we just had the option and the choice to make that decision, understanding that this was a possibility, I think it would have been easier for us. Parking has been mentioned, traffic has been mentioned. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about security because you know, uh, the applicant made mention that, you know, there's not going to be an issue around security. Well, being a resident in Belo Lago for the last few months, we've had multiple break-ins and vandalism with no, with, without 152 uh, apartments close by. And not to suggest that seniors are going to be out uh, breaking in through my back door, but at the same time, that also brings things like traffic. Uh, it increases foot and vehicle traffic exposure to the community insufficient police presence to ensure safety of our homeowners, and generally speaking, not exactly what we had in mind when we purchased in this area. Um, that's about all I want to focus on at this point in time, because there's a, a number of other comments that have been made already that have uh, resonated with me, and I hope with you as well. I thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, sir, and I appreciate your uh, sticking to new points to highlight and just reinforcing those that have been mentioned. Uh, Tracy and Gary Gordon, you're up next, please. <coughs> Hello, uh, Mr. Gordon. Hi there. It's uh, yeah, Gary Gordon here. Yes, this floor is yours. Yeah, uh, thank you. Uh, most of the points have been already made. We're in the process of uh, building a home um, in, in the Bella Lago Estates. And it was uh, definitely a surprise to us to think that, you know, something like uh, twin five-story apartments were going in. Yeah. That's really all we had to add that hasn't been spoken about. Okay, uh, thank you very much then for making your points and we'll move on to the next people. Uh, that would be Adam Bain, please. Yeah. I'm going to go out, no problem. So Heather, I'm having the same experience. We'll move to the next uh, list. Uh, here is Richard Salinka. Richard Salinka? Okay. Uh, Richard Salinka, you're next. I, I'm not sure if we lost somebody or just having difficulty, but if they show up, we'll come back to them and you should go now. Hello. Okay. Now <laughs> I, I'm, I'm starting the five minute clock three times now, but it's your turn. So okay. <laughs> thank you very much, Madam Mayor and uh, members of council. Uh, my name is Richard Zelenka. I'm a planning consultant with Zelenka Priamo Limited, and we are the planning advisors to Mr. Jim Graham. Uh, he's resident at 22393 Kamoka Road, just to the south of the, these lands. Uh, I did speak to council at the uh, meeting you held in 2019, uh, and I see that there's uh, been no change in the in the proposal since then. However, uh, I, I would like to emphasize a few points 
uh, about this. Uh, now, there have been a num number of uh, issues raised by uh, residents in the area, uh, but I would like to um, use my allotted time to address what I consider to be uh, the overriding and fundamental planning issue relating to this proposal. And that is that the proposal would undermine the planned urban structure of the Kamoka Kilworth community as the as was adopted by council and it and uh, placed into the Kamoka Kilworth uh, secondary plan of the official plan. The uh, the subject lands are planned to be. Uh, well, they have been planned as an open space area surrounding a regional stormwater management facility. And they were placed into a parks and recreation designation, not a holding designation, parks and recreation designation reflecting the intended use of the lands. Um, and yet the application coming forward to this council is one that would establish uh, the highest uh, permissions for residential intensities uh, that, that exist within the community. That by itself is significant. However, the context is even more significant in my in my opinion. And that, that is that council through its uh, secondary plan process established a bold urban structure for Kamoka Kilworth, a structure that a new structure that would combine the two communities uh, with a focal point being the Middlesex Center wellness and recreation center. Uh, and around that center would be a dense urban area uh, and intensive, intensive uses of uh, medium density residential and, and village center uses um, uh, that would have a symbiotic relationship with the, the um, uh, recreation center. They would support each other in order to provide uh, a very vibrant, robust uh, village center for this community. And um, this, what we're seeing now is uh, not that. What it is, is an application, an ad hoc approach, uh, which does not relate to the structure that was established by council and is not part of a, of a broader planning process for the community. Uh, your official plan uh, review consultants haven't come back to you and said, you've got it all wrong, uh, your village center is in the wrong place, or that you should rethink you, this bold vision that you have for the community, or that your, your village center can't accommodate the growth and intensity that, that was designed for. Um, in fact, the, the um, recently released Watson report uh, on land needs shows that, that there is no need for additional residential lands to support the, the structure of the community. So what you have then is, is an ad hoc approach that, that seeks to change the fundamental structure of the community. Um, and in doing that, it is establishing a second community focus not the community focus based on the wellness center, which, which council and this, this community invested a lot into as its, as its focus, but a new focus on the, uh, the, the Tim Hortons corner. Um, and and this, is, this is a major departure from the vision that, that council has established for the community. And in doing this, in setting up a new focus, you lose the benefits of the, the village center. You lose the cohesive community focus, the walkability, the amenity. You don't have to take a bus uh, to that uh, wellness center from the designed uh, medium density residential and, and village center uses that are, that are uh, planned for around it. You have the walkability to the, to the, uh, the wellness center. Um, the amenities, the, the public spaces, they're all there. And that's what's planned for the community. So I just ask um, council uh, in its consideration of this matter to, to identify that this site specific application that's before you should not be used uh, to change the fundamental structure of this community, of this the plan 
uh, structure of this community. Thank you, Madam. Thank you. And uh, our next resident is Ralph Citro. Are you? Mr. Citro, are you there? Hello? No? And we'll come back to Ralph if he's there. Okay, Jim Graham, um, we're skipping to you now, please, if, you, if you're on the line. Once again, good evening, Madam Chair, Council, and staff. Twice, here we are. <laughs> you only get five minutes this time, sorry. <laughs> I hope to watch out and uh, yeah, I'll do my best. I'm trying to keep things, I, I like three points because that's all I can remember. First point, stormwater. Currently, for those who don't know, all of the stormwater in Kamoka, west of the Wellness Center, south of the tra right, train tracks, uh, drain into the ponds of the applicant. And an email dated June 25th, 2017, former director of public works, Brian Lima, stated that without discharge into my pond, quote, would cause water levels in Bella Lago Pond may risk causing detrimental damage to upstream properties serviced by the Middlesex Kamoka drainage works, unquote. A temporary interim cut has been done, made into my pond through a mutually constructed berm with the applicant and exists today discharging Kamoka's untreated stormwater property through the Powell Pond onto my property. I urge you before any densification, including severances, including the Springer Pond uh, uh, application earlier, those should not occur until this liability is corrected. Middlesex Center I know is working on a, on a stormwater master plan and the pond on this applicant's property has been deemed the preferred choice to receive and treat stormwater, in, but this could be years away. So why increase potential liability of untreated and unmanaged stormwater in the Powell Pond draining into my pond until these facilities have been approved and constructed? And why would we be considering adding any density, especially this significant, that could increase that liability? Second thing is the park, and I think it's a good segue. Although I know this parcel is not currently part of the municipality's park and master and parks and recreation plan, wouldn't it make sense that a parks and recreation designation remain on this site so it can be part of the regional infrastructure, including the stormwater pond? Right now, residents of Bella Lago, if they have to walk their dog, have to drive several kilometers to the wellness center, to the community center. Kids have to do the same, no sidewalks, through the, through the, through the, uh, through the community. Uh, why would the municipality even consider taking, uh, taking parks and recreation designation away when we know we want to intensify development along the uh, Glendon Drive? And would we consider buying parks and or land to put into parks and recreation designation so that those areas have, have those services available to them? Finally, good land use planning. Uh, you know what? I did not object. I'm a good, I am a proponent of good planning and I did not object to any of the development in Bella Lago or the commercial plaza. Uh, I do find it oppor opportunistic that this application is before us because it wasn't part of any of the original applications. It seems after the fact, uh, though the, the, the proposals for the other land use were, were, uh, were done and, uh, and, and, uh, and I thought were, were, were good planning. I don't think it's good planning to create another satellite node, node of, of density residential. Uh, let's keep it close to the wellness center. 
Retirement uh, facilities certainly are something that uh, all communities need. And we've designed those lands around the wellness center for them. The ab application is absolutely ad hoc. And my concern is this precedent setting, that this uh, density, density can take place on uh, any parks and rec zoning, private or, or any other higher, higher zoning that could be, uh, could be uh, moved down in Kamoka. I really urge council to stay true to the current official plan, keeping density around the wellness center and along Glendon Drive, not infill, or behind Glendon Drive or behind the what's already exist. I don't think we want the hub of our community to be a satellite node at the Tim Hortons. I guess uh, real quick in conclusion, I urge staff, I urge council to refuse this application. Stormwater is and will become a greater liability and would increase exponentially with this development. No development should be considered on this site until the swim master plan has been constructed. As a park is designated, doesn't make sense that it doesn't make sense this is not remain park especially when areas um, there's going to be densification on the Glendon Drive and uh, we wouldn't want to have to buy new lands for parks and recreation when we've already got something designated that could likely be part of a regional stormwater facility. Uh, this designation should have been considered when, when all the other uh, official plan uh, designations were applied for as part of the original Bella Lago and commercial plan. The, we need infrastructure that is designed and, you know, it, the, the Bella Lago and the commercial plant plaza, the infrastructure is there, but to support something this intensive, uh, to get folks to where they need to be at the so-called hub without moving a hub, I think is dangerous. I guess I just want to suggest don't start the precedent of density creep with creating satellite nodes of higher density when we've already identified how we can best use our wellness center through our official plan. So I, I, uh, I hope, uh, hope I can add some texture to some of the things already said. Thank you. Thank you. And last we have Rob Junkins, right? Yes, sir. Okay, good. Hello, am I in yet? Yes, please, Rob, if you'd get started. And um, if you've got any new points to add, that'd be appreciated. Sounds great. Sounds great. Um, so a couple things here that I'd like to just chime in on. Um, the municipality, if I'm not mistaken, um, uh, has just finished the Leisure Services Master Plan Survey, which notes that the members of the community who participated in the survey do not or cannot participate in recreational activities as often as they would like due to a lack of services and facilities available. Why would we allow this parkland to be removed from the inventory of valuable land when this could be developed into future needs to fulfill some of those for the community? Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Also, it is noted in the LDS geotechnical design brief in May 2019 that, quote, as part of the scoping procedure for the hydrogeological -geo assessment, an understanding of the stormwater management strategy for the village of Kamoka is required. Would be in, I be, would be interested in seeing the municipality's stormwater management strategy, kind of to piggyback off what Jim just mentioned um, for Kamoka. Um, additionally, the PPS speaks to the environmentally healthy, minimized or prevent an increase in negative impacts on the environment and water system. Why the need for monitoring the wells? It is also noted that there will be a disbursement into the ponds located around this area. And what does that look like and how does it affect, uh, impact these properties? Um, section one uh, in the PPS, section 1.0, building strong, healthy communities, long-term prosperity, environmental health and social well-being. Removing lands designated as parks and recreation, the additional traffic and impact already suffering infrastructure, hydro, internet, et cetera, water, I'll add in too, our water costs, um, does not say strong, healthy, social well-being and environmentally healthy. Um, section 1.1 also says managing and directing land use to achieve efficient, resilient development and land use patterns. Will other lands be designated and recreation as recreation with the removal of these lands from that inventory. Um, section 3.2, quote, uh, human made hazard states that development on former mineral mining operations, uh, mineral aggregate operations or petroleum resource operations may only be permitted if 
rehab or other measures to address or mitigate known or suspected hazards are underway or have been completed. Were these completed? I'm just not aware of those. Um, and then there's a couple couple maps that I sent in to uh, uh, James earlier. I'm, I th think he said he was going to share those around. So just of the site, there's a 2010, uh, like the present map of, this, of the area shows uh, one lake and a lot of land. But if you look back to 2010, it shows a smaller pond. There was two ponds there and one's been filled in, it looks like after 2010. I would just like to ask council if a permit was taken or needed for that to be filled in. Just kind of curious that the two pictures, there's a second pond there and it's just disappeared now. Um, also, <clears throat> due to limited employment opportunities, retail options and sidewalks, um, so many parking spots are considered here. Um, I don't think anyone's mentioned, and I'm just kind of curious about the local impact on schools. Um, obviously that new development sending a bunch of kids to Delaware and, you know, um, Parkview uh, already full, my kids go there. Um, you know, I'm not really sure where that's gonna lead. Um, and at what point will Delaware not be able to accommodate uh, new? And then the setback off of Kamoka Road should be larger than the three meters uh, that I think is being proposed right now. Like I think the zoning bylaw states a minimum six meters. However, Kamoka Road is a county road. Um, is there a larger setback off of that? Um, <clears throat> and, you know, you just- You need to wrap up now, Rob. Yeah. Lastly, I'll just, what Anna, Anna, Rod, Lucier, those people are amazing. And I would just shout everything they said over and over again, like everybody that's gone before me, bravo. Thank you. Okay, so now those, okay, so the people who were not available are still not available. So I'm going to look now to council. Comments, questions, observations? Oh, sorry. My raised hand, I forgot about those people. One moment, please. Those people who have not registered but are attending virtually and who would like to comment on this application, if you'd like to speak, um, please use your raise hand feature now and get in the queue. Okay, so Larry Davis is coming on now. Can you hear me all right now? I can hear you. Um, okay, we're good. giving everyone five minutes. I'm reminding That's... you. And if you could bring up new points, please. Yes, I will. Thank um, you. My concern about this, these two five-story towers is, have, have, has the county uh, hired anybody yet to put scuba gear on and go into that pond and identify where the aquifer, aquifers are, as well as the velocity of the water coming out from them? And the reason I ask is that, and I'm not sure where the water runoff is from the storm sewers. If that hits at 90 degrees or even close to it, it's going to start undercutting. Even if it's a, a concrete floating slab that the buildings are built on, it's gonna undermine and we'll have a situation very similar to what Miami had a year or so ago, could potentially. Let me put that in, I'll put that in there, potentially because the aquifer will continually chew away at the gravel. That was it. Okay, thank you very much for your input. Thank you. Okay, and there are no more raised hands according to the clerk. Um, so now I will go back to my comment about council. If <laughs> councillors want to ask questions, comments, Councillor Cates. Thank you, through you, Madam Mayor. Um, so I have... Uh, notes and notes. Um, first, I want to say thank you again to everybody that reached out to me or emailed um, about this. Um, much appreciated to um, hear from everybody. Um, so, um, you know, Jim and Rob, there's been lots of talk about the, uh, the storm water, the pond, etc. So I did have a bunch of notes about that. So um, I won't go into detail. The second pond that Rob mentioned, that was one that I wondered about, especially when it's, you know, over in the location of 
where the near where the building was going to be. Um, how did that happen? And is it is it safe enough? Um, and and with Mr. Graham's berm being down, those are some of the things as well. Um, so I'll leave the stormwater part of it. I think it's been expressed well. Um, I do think that you know my original thought to think to go from parks and recreation all the way to medium density is qu quite a huge. Um, quite a huge jump. And, um, you know, Mr. Uh, Knudsen brought up the history um, and I had already planned to mention something about that as well. Um, you know, in the original design of Bella Lago uh, that Mr. Powell had, and this was a part of it, and this was a parks and recreation area. And then Bella Lago was sold off and this property was retained. And now all of a sudden the parks and recreation can disappear and it become medium density. So it is, a, a, you know, a little bit of a, a drastic change, that's for sure. Um, and, you know, skipping ahead to, uh, you know, it, it really makes me, I would love to ask, uh, you know, is this something that you plan to de de develop yourself and rent these out and retain this as a rental property? Or is this just something that you want to get the zoning on uh, so as that you can sell it and it's worth more? Um, I really, you know, I really need to ask that. Um, as far as the development itself, there's a, uh, some, uh, some things that I have a, a, an, an issue with. Um, and Mr. Knudsen answered my, my one thought, is it still going to be a seniors? Uh, so yes, you say seniors only. Um, and I have concerns at that, of, you know, is the seniors only just a buzzword? Uh, in Kamoka, uh, Kamoka Kilworth and, and other areas, but I know for a fact in Kamoka Kilworth, we have a lot of need. It's not just seniors who are, uh, you know, lived their whole life in Kamoka in their, in their pro house with the big property, and now they're going to downsize and they need somewhere to go. Definitely there's a need, but we also have the young adults that have lived in Kamoka their whole life and they want to leave home, but where can they go? Um, and we have a lot of single parents as well. So there is a need for a lot of uh, 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 all of those things, not just for the seniors. Um, so then it brings me to, I read that uh, one bedroom apartments, 790 square feet. And it's like, so now they're going from their, um, their, nice house they've lived in forever to a little tiny 790 square foot and in my opinion I think that we should be seeing at least two actual bedrooms two and three bedrooms not a bunch of one bedrooms with some twos uh, you know if it is seniors only grand, uh, grandkids come over and etc so I think that there's a need to take a look at that um, on the plan, and it better fills the needs. Again, if it's not only seniors, uh, single parents, and um, it, it, you know, it, it's uh, better filling the needs, like I said. The other thing is, uh, is the, um, the parking. So if we have uh, 152 units on the plan, uh, and we are a rural community, so quite likely, and I think we need to plan for uh, two cars per unit. Um, now we're at 304 cars and you have 166 parking, parking spots and only five visitor. So if it actually is a seniors, there's going to be family coming and there's going to be potentially healthcare people coming. Um, so whoever's living there, five visitor parking spots is definitely not enough for uh, um, definitely, you know, you could multiply that many times over to get some better uh, visitor parking. And, you know, of course, I have to ask myself five stories, uh, you know, what about three at least? So um, I think that that is uh, the only other thing I had was the whole stormwater. I think it's a, the, the project is very risky from the, from the stormwater point of view. And, you know, Mr. Graham's berm is down. What if the berm was up, you know, is this going to all be flooded? I think that there better, 
that there's other things that need to be um, taken care of first. Is there Thank anyone you. else? You're welcome. Thank you. Councillor Arts. Through your Madam <clears throat> Mayor, this is maybe just to verify a few things. The, the official plan designated get parks and recs, but it, it's it's not its own agricultural too right now. So a designation and a zoning. There people are muddling everything up and assuming it's zoned parks and recs, which it is not. Um, when the gentleman spoke from the beaver, I think he got north and south mixed up. He said he was north of uh, the proposed thing, and I'm pretty, we're cockeyed in Lobo Township. We run on an angle. North, north of that is the, the old, where the Bank of Montreal and all that used to be. Yeah. yeah. He's right, it just doesn't matter. It's, it's, it's a Lobo thing. Okay. And I know everyone talks about green space and wildlife and all that, but what people fail to mention is their houses were built on green space. Their houses were built where wildlife had. I know it's nice to see, but people also should, once they get something, well, then they don't want anyone else to have it. That's just an observation. I'm not taking sides on anything. And as far as the, the what lands drain towards the pond there on the Powell property, the wellness center does not go that way. It was mentioned that it did. So the, the watershed where the stormwater goes, that's some people have interpreted it a little different than others. Thank you. Okay, and I have uh, Councillor Scott next. Brad, we can't hear you. Can you hear us? Okay. Is he muted? So maybe the volume then. He needs to add on his message to me now. Oh, I mean, his system. Yeah. 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 So have you turned your volume on? Oh, it's the laptop or not? With this device, that is a, yeah. Unfortunately, we're not knowing what device that is for. While we get, is there anyone else who wants to jump in while we're waiting for Brad to jump in? No? Oh, maybe last then. Yeah. Do you want to give him a chance to speak? He's gonna. He's he's given us the okay to move forward. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, well, in that case, that would, he would have been the last speaker. I want to keep moving with the agenda, so I do have a motion before us, and it is that the report planning 81-2021 regarding the official plan amendment OPA forty six and the zoning bylaw amendment files at BA twenty. 2019 for lands known as 22447 Kamoka Road be received for information. I'm over in a second. Yes, Councillors uh, Cates and Deputy Mayor Brennan. All in favor. And I see hands up there too. Okay, thank you, Council. We have another, even larger file to work through still. Breathe. <laughs> or do, do we need to take a little recess? We need to take this. Everyone ready to keep moving on? Because we have a whole whack of people still. I think we should continue to move forward. Okay, so we're moving on. If you need to walk away, walk away, and we'll just keep on going. So this is the application for plan of condominium uh, for Elmhurst Street in Kilworth. And um, 
Marion, it's yours to take away, please. Great. Thank you, Madam Mayor and Council, and thanks for uh, lasting this long uh, into the evening. So the purpose of this report is to provide information to Council regarding a plan of condominium application, official uh, plan amendment application, and zoning bylaw amendment application for the lands known as 6, 10, and 14 Elmhurst Street in Kilworth. I'll quickly just share my screen to provide a location map. Okay. <clears throat> So the purpose and effect of the official plan amendment and rezoning applications are to redesignate the lands uh, to a medium density residential um, designation and rezone to a site specific urban residential third density zone to permit 56 dwellings, uh, amend the permitted uses and amend some uh, zoning standards related to the site plan application. The purpose and effect of the plan of condominium is to create 56 units. 28 of these units will be for single detached dwellings and 56 units, sorry, 28 units would be for back-to-back -back townhouse dwellings. So the lands are approximately five acres in area and have frontage onto Elmhurst, uh, sorry, Elmhurst Street, uh, just south of Glendon Drive. The lands are surrounded by residential uh, lands, which are primarily low density uh, to the southeast um, north and west, and some commercial lands exist to the northwest along Glendon Drive. The lands also contain some significant woodland along the northern portion of the property, and they do also exist on the abutting property uh, to the north as well. As mentioned, a site plan application was submitted in addition to the plan of condominium official plan and zoning bylaw applications. Um, from this site plan application, the development proposes uh, two accesses onto um, um, Elmhurst Street and one internal road, which is a horseshoe shape that you can see on the location map. 28 single detached dwellings will back onto the perimeter of the property and 28 townhouses will be located within the center. The single detached dwellings are proposed to be one story in height and the townhouses will be a maximum of two stories. Each unit will have two parking spaces where one is in the driveway and one would be in the garage. A uh, centrally located amenity area will abut the visitor parking in the center of the development uh, and this will contain the communal mailbox as well. Municipal serving does not Servicing does not currently exist to service these lands. The applicant proposes to extend servicing along Parklands Place as well as Elmhurst Street so that all units will use full municipal servicing in accordance with the uh, policies of the official plan as well as the provincial policy statement. Stormwater uh, runoff will be managed on site through catch basins and infiltration underneath the private road. Landscaping and fencing is also proposed along the property boundaries and a lighting plan is also proposed for the private roadway. Uh, no sidewalks are proposed within this development or along Elmhurst Street. So the applicant did submit a number of reports and plans to support their applications and those are attached to the planning report. Infill and intensification again is generally supported by the provincial policy statement, county official plan, and Middlesex Center official plan, provided that no negative impact to natural heritage features and the development can be supported by municipal services and amenities within the area. Higher density development is aimed to be located in proximity to open space areas, village centers, and commercial areas, as well as within proximity to main transportation corridors. The applicant proposes uh, this new site-specific zone to permit the townhouses and um, single detached dwellings. Again, the site-specific standards will reflect development proposal as well as the site plan application, um, and that is noted within the planning report. Notice of the application and the public meeting was circulated to agencies and area residents. At the time of writing the report, staff did not receive any comments. However, we have received significant comments from area residents, um, especially located within the Coworth area. Uh, however, um, sorry, some uh, issues that were addressed by area residents include uh, the impact of the increased density, which is not compatible with the existing neighborhood, additional stress on the local road network uh, and intersection, especially at Elmhurst and Glendon Drive, which is already limited. Uh, there's concern about pedestrian safety with additional cars uh, that will all uh, empty out onto Elmhurst Street. Uh, there's a, going to be a lack of green space, especially after trees are removed from the property. Uh, there's concern about big pollution from the additional housing as well as the street lamps that are proposed. Uh, concerns about, uh, again, the street lights in general and the removal of trees. 
uh, changes to the neighborhood feel, um, opposition to the increased municipal services, which will run through the Kilworth area, and as well the impact on infrastructure, including the utility system, um, hydro, um, gas, water, and sanitary, as well as impact on the school system. So at the time of, of writing this report, I did not receive comments from the chief building official. Um, however, during pre-consultation, comments were received uh, to ensure that the proposed development in St. Clinton uh, meets the Ontario Building Code requirements. A detailed comments will be provided related to the site plan application. Similarly, the public works and engineering um, team did not provide detailed comments related to these applications. However, they do provide uh, detailed comments related to uh, the site plan, specifically um, the proposed servicing and stormwater management plan. Uh, the county engineer did review the applications uh, during pre-consultation and noted that there uh, may need to be improvements to the intersection at London Drive and Elmhurst Street. Uh, however, there is consideration for other options at this intersection. So the county road is designed to handle the increased traffic and the recent environmental assessment considers growth throughout Kamoga and Kilworth. So it's noted that uh, the additional uh, traffic generation would not have impacts or negative impacts onto uh, Glendon Drive. However, that intersection um, may become problematic. Uh, county planning staff have concern with the compatibility of the proposed development and surrounding low density residential community. While it is important for infill and medium density to occur within urban areas like Kilworth and Kamoka, the number and uh, number of units and lot fabric proposed may be incompatible with the existing community. Uh, the Upper Thames uh, River Conservation Authority had not provided any comments. Um, however, they did provide feedback during the pre-consultation phase and provided guidance on the completion of the development assessment report, which the applicant has provided as part of their application. So as mentioned, the purpose of this report is to provide feedback um, or sorry, provide information to the council and the public for feedback. Um, at a future date, which is yet to be determined, staff will provide a recommendation to council. I'll be happy to answer any questions at this time. Thank you for your report, Marion. Um, um, Mr. Gubbles, Anthony Gubbles has registered to speak on behalf of the applicant. Are you there, Mr. Gubbles? I believe I am. At ah, this point. Yes, we can hear you now. Okay, excellent. Uh, the, floor is, the floor is yours for your presentation. Thank you very much. Good evening, Madam Mayor and members of Council. My name is Anthony Gubbles, and I am a principal engineer with LDS Consultants located in London. Um, in the interest of time and consideration of Marianne's thorough presentation, um, I really do not have anything further to add at this point in time, and I would suggest um moving uh, this matter to uh, open it up to the public for for comment okay that's great um so we can now turn to the red uh, the people who've uh, registered to speak the first people are win and nick Roche. All right, am I coming on? You are, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. And I, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, we are longtime residents of, of Elmhurst Street. And in fact, my parents bought the lot here in 1963. So we go way back. Um, we have witnessed a lot of change. And uh, if for those who are involved in the planning, haven't taken a walk around this block, I invite you to do so because that reinforces what staff said. And I was happy to hear that that this uh, rezoning application is incompatible with our neighborhood. You would see that immediately. Uh, we have a number of concerns. I know I sent an email and so I'm going to highlight just a few of those in, um, because of the time factor and then get to one piece in particular. I raised concerns about the physical safety in the neighborhood. We have much narrower streets here on Elmhurst and uh, Beech Nut and Parkland with no street lights. And we see that there would be significant dangers for people walking and biking because of the increased traffic. 
The amount of traffic and the high speed of traffic on Glendon Drive are a big concern, um, especially between Kilworth Park Drive and Kilworth Bridge, because the speed limit actually increases as you head toward the bridge right now. Um, it's quite dangerous. There is um, overuse of that road, and we think it's just a recipe for, for disaster. We also are very concerned about the loss of natural resources in that area, loss of habitat for plants and anim animals, and the number of mature trees, particularly all the walnut trees that are there. Um, and that is concerning. There is a significant loss of safe places to walk and play, especially for the children. Uh, we have a lot of children in our neighborhood and there's a deaf child on Elmhurst Street. And we're wondering if council has in, studied any of these concerns and I'm happy to hear that this is an information meeting and there'll be, there should be more data coming through, I would hope. We've had time to look further since the email that we sent and uh, we are, we are um, gonna focus on one particular piece and that is that this uh, proposal goes in direct contradiction to the vision for Middlesex Centre. What it says is that Middlesex Centre is a thriving, progressive and welcoming community that honors our rural roots and embraces our natural spaces. We don't see that in this proposal at all. We are a unique community in Old Kilworth and what this proposal is asking is for us to become an extension of what is happening in London. Infill as many places to live as possible, no matter what. I understand the provincial push for a, what they call affordable housing, housing, but this is an oversimplified approach and it does not fit with this vision statement. This is not progressive. A progressive approach would have involved far more consultation and pre-planning to ensure that our rural routes, our natural spaces continue to be the focus for rezoning applications. Though we miss Gabriel's farm next door to us, we do know that this was a long-term plan and it was very involved and filled a lot of need. But the big piece that we see is that it was planned in long term. Sadly for us, this is not the same here. Other areas of Middlesex Centre's official plan also support our wish to keep the zoning as low density and respect the present low density and green area at the top of 610 and 14 Elmhurst. Section 31A of the plan speaks to the need of, to identify, protect, sustain, and enhance the natural and environmental features and functions within the municipality's Greenland system. This does seem to fit, and we encourage that as well. It says to promote and encourage the retention of existing woodlots and corridors. I think the point's clear. We also recognize this little corner of Middlesex is actually the first community as you enter from London's Oxford Street. This is an opportunity for council to show that we live by this vision, that we thrive and are progressive by not allowing this high density area to be built on land, which will not thrive, not be welcoming, not honor our rural roots not embrace our natural spaces. Please turn this down and ensure that the boards, that the county's vision is respected. Thank you. Okay, thank you for that presentation. Uh, next up, Alexis Van Logenstein. I think John is, yeah, so Alexis and John Van Logenstein. Can you see and hear us? Uh, you're on, you're on, you're ready to go. Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks so much for having us. Uh, so again, my name is Alexis Van Lochtenstein and my husband, John, we both wrote separate letters. Actually, we had enough to say that we, we submitted two. Um, so I'm just going to speak very briefly and then John will have a few things to say. We are at 12 Parkland Place. So we're backing on to the proposed development. Um, I just want to emphasize where this is for anyone who doesn't know. So we really are at the outskirts of Kilworth. We are not in the newer part, the part that's rapidly developing. We're not close to the wellness center. We're not close to the sort of proposed center of Kilworth and Kamoka, we're really at the very rural edge. Um, none of our area has municipal services. We're on half acre to one acre lots. So when we're thinking about, you know, intensification um, within those service areas, within the more urban parts of Kilworth, it's really not I don't think old Kilworth is what we think about. They would have to bring services. We don't have services out here to support this. Um, Another thing, you know, something I said in my letter, we're not opposed to development. In fact, El Elmhurst needs some rejuvenation. Anyone who lives here knows that the street's been a little bit neglected recently for various reasons. Um, 
some of the houses aren't lived in or are sort of underutilized. So it, it needs some attention and we're really not opposed to developing those three lots. Uh, it's five acres, there's a lot they could do there. Um, but we would like to see something that fits more in the character of our neighborhood. So we're not saying that it has to be, you know, half acre or one acre lots, but there's a lot more they could do um, and still maintain septic. So, you know, maybe quarter acre or one third acre lots and still put, you know, they could still densify and still bring more people in. We love our neighborhood. We'd love to have more neighbors. We wish more people could experience Old Kilworth. Um, 56 units is just way too much. I mean, it's almost doubling the population of what we call Old Kilworth just within that. Um, versus what already exists. Um, one more thing, um, something that upset us, I guess, seeing this proposal is that really the developer, they never came to us, nobody talked to us, um, and we feel that they, they've really made no effort to sort of bring anything positive to the community. So they're putting in all of these units and all of these people. Um, the townhouse is in the middle. As far as we can understand the plan, they don't even have a back door. So I think it's like a block. They don't have a backyard, never mind a back door. They can't barbecue outside. Like these people have no resources and they don't bring anything to Old Kilworth. They're not giving us a playground or green space or something for the rest of the community to use. We actually don't have any sort of public spaces in Old Kilworth. We love it here, but to go to the park with our three kids, we have to walk to New Kilworth and that's, you know, that's getting even busier. Um, so those are kind of my main concerns. Yes, and mine, mine are very, <clears throat> very similar. Um, you know, I think, I think what I see in my letter kind of stress that is that the developer is not taking any consideration for the character and the feel of Kamoka Kilworth. They are trying to ram as many houses as possible into this space to maximize their profits. And it is blatantly obvious that that's what they're trying to do. There is nowhere in Kamoka or Kilworth right now that has these two story block condos and they're trying to put it into probably the least dense area. And their planning reports that uh, LDS prepared for them they're trying to provide justification for all this stuff. And it's, it's almost comical. Um, you know, they talk about, they talk about uh, that the majority of houses are two stories around there. Well, they're not, they're single story houses that are backing to this development. Uh, the majority are single story. There's nowhere that has these two story block condos anywhere. And, you know, they're trying to, they're trying to justify that, oh, there's open space um, nearby. And that's why, you know, they don't have to do anything within the development. Well, it, if you look at their map on what it, they consider open space, they're actually like, they're actually noting um, the backyards of some of the residents of Old Kilworth. Okay. So like, if you look, they have the backyards of the houses that back onto the river noted as open space. So they're trying to piggyback off of people that have you know, invested in a large property or whatever and consider that open space so they don't have to provide any of these amenities for the, um, for the people that are gonna move into this development. So like Alexa said, we're not against development. We think that, you know, put, put 10, put 15 houses there, you know, put something that's reasonable, something that, you know, you can do third acre lots, something like that. Um, you know, the developer can still make a profit you know, they're not, maybe they won't make as much as what they thought they were going to make when they bought these properties, but, you know, they can still do something that fits within the character. It's still going to achieve the goals of densification. You know, if you put 15 houses there, that's a 500% increase in densification versus what was there before. What they're proposing is almost 2000%. Like it's insane. It does not make sense. It does not fit with what the community is after. Um, and, and, you know, the other part of it too, is the safety point. Like we live on parkland. And pretty well, all the traffic is going to go down Kilworth Park Drive, Parkland, Elmhurst. And, you know, we have three little kids, one, three, and five. And they play out in the front yard. Well, that's not going to happen anymore. You know, it's a quality of life thing that's going to get impacted because all this traffic is going to come during a three-hour window down Parkland Place, majority down Parkland Place, because it's come from London. They can't turn on to Elmhurst. They have to go down Kilworth, Parkland, Elmhurst. That's... I think I calculated it, like 75 cars an hour. So a car every 45 seconds, you know, kids aren't going to be able to walk. Kids aren't going to be able to, uh, you know, go to their friend's house or anything like that. It just brings into question, like what the developer is trying to do. Like they're, they're proposing to put this. We need to crazy... wrap it up, John. Yeah. I'm sorry. We're over time here. <laughs> they're, they're, they're proposing for this crazy dense development in there. 
and they're not taking into consideration any of the concerns of the neighbors. You know, if they would have came, talked to us, done stuff like that, you know, kind of tried to make. Okay. Next, we have Mr. Larry Davis. Yes, we, yes, he spoke at the other one too. Can ask him now? I, I didn't oh, have my, I didn't yes. have my hand up, so you, you guys go to the next person. Oh, okay. Thank you very Thank much. You. Appreciate Thank the you. time, Mike Murdy. Then, Mr. Murdy, we just gained five more minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Dana, oh, I'll say this wrong. Dana's not on? Okay. John Simpson's next. Do you see him? Oh, good. Okay. Oh. Hello, Council. Can you hear me? Please go ahead. Hello. Hello? Uh, it's John Simpson speaking from yes, 38 Elmhurst Street. Uh, Madam Mayor and Council, uh, I, as, as I mentioned in the remarks, I strongly oppose the rezoning in the area at Elmhurst and Glenhurst at the end of my street. The, the, as uh, John and Alexis mentioned, the proposed development will almost double number of families in Old Kilworth, and that will really have a negative impact on our neighborhood. And I'll let some of the other neighbors um, discuss some of those uh, negative impacts. But if the area is going to be developed, I would propose something less than John Alexis, and I'd like to see single family homes that are similar in size and value and similar for lots as well, or, or, or better as well. So my, my biggest concern of all is that I know for sure that if the zoning is changed to higher density, the developers will continue to purchase homes in our area because they're on larger lots. And then they'll come back to council and say, oh, guess what? We have this precedent. We already have existing zoning at the end of the street. We'd like to build another 40 townhouses. And I think over time, the problem is that uh, our quiet neighborhood will disappear completely. And that makes me kind of sad. So I would urge council to oppose the rezoning application and thank you very much for your time. Thank you for yours, sir. Okay, next we have Rebecca Hebert. Rebecca Hebert. Am I on? Yes, Ms. Zieber, go ahead. Hi, I live at uh, 7 Elmhurst Street. So I'm directly across the street from the new development. And I would say my biggest concern right now is what kind of security there's going to be um, while the construction is ongoing. I have a 
mentally disabled child who's a flight risk living directly across the street. So it's very important to me that, you know, if we're going to have a lot of big machinery, um, a lot of, you know, large holes, what kind of security and fencing and so forth that would be used. And other than that, I would echo a lot of the same concerns that I think other people have articulated better than myself. Would that be everything then? Yes. Okay, appreciate your time tonight. Thank you. Eric Clinton. Okay, next we have Eric Clinton. Okay, um, I'm unmuted now, good. Yes, you can speak now. Okay, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and members of council. Uh, my name is Eric Clinton and I live at 35 Beach and it's about one street away from the proposed development. Um, actually, many of my concerns were touched on in Marion's opening remarks. And I also agree with uh, what the branches had said and the Van Logensteins. And I um, don't think you have anything else to add except I drive a, a, a school bus and I use Elmhurst every day. And right now that road is insufficient just to pass a car, let alone passing uh, construction trucks and cement mixers. And, and I'm, I, I'm concerned. So uh, I, I, I don't think this project should go ahead. I'm, I, I'm opposed, um, but if it should get accepted, the least they could do is improve that roadway first. Um, that's it. I. That's it for me. Okay. Thank you very much, sir. Okay. Uh, we'll move to Kyle Cooper. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Kyle Cooper. Um, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please. Great, thanks for your time. Uh, appreciate you staying on and uh, listening to everybody's comments. Um, I, I'm not gonna repeat uh, the things that have been detailed. I, I live on uh, with my wife and, and two, uh, two and a half year old children on 54 Beach, Birchcrest Drive. Um, so not in the, in the close vicinity of the area, but um, I guess my concerns are really around um, you know, similar items. Um, currently, right now, as as we all know in the area, it's 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 uh, impossible to turn left on Kilworth Park Drive. So, majority of that uh, traffic does get redirected uh, down down Birchcrest, um, which which significantly in, in impacts uh, our lives as it is now. Um, it just even tonight, uh, I had a daughter almost get hit by a car just from people coming up Kilworth Park Drive and turning left. Uh, so. A concern there with the traffic and the insufficiencies of uh, proper stoplights or roundabouts at Kilworth and Glendon. Um, I, and I think I'll just kind of go back to the, the, the community, the feel. I know that I can speak for probably most of the, the folks on the call that we moved here three years ago for the community. Um, and we, we like the small town community and, and that's, that's where I grew up in and that's where I wanted my children to be raised in. I know now with with increasing the volume and the density and as some of the other folks commented of, of actually doubling the the density it would it, it's 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 incredible I just uh, walked down Elmhurst and Parkland and Beechnut this morning um, and I only counted 53 homes so adding another 56 it's it's uh, it's just uh, it just doesn't fit for for our small town feel um, as you can you can feel and hear for a lot of the the members of our community, they all know each other quite well. And, and adding that much more volume um, impacts other things as well. Um, I didn't hear many people touch on yet our our parks and our communities. I know that uh, you know just getting in for for a pickleball game or something like that, it, the, the lineup is starting to grow. And adding in that additional density uh, to our parks in different areas also brings a lot of other other related items, uh, you know, we, we some some folks talked about security related to, con to construction. Um, I also think about security related to to our homes and our um, and our properties. Uh, you know, as as many folks know, there's from time to time uh, cars and, and different items can get vandalized, and I think bringing in uh, a lot of 56 more 
more commit more houses is, is a lot more vehicles so it's a lot more reason to to bring some of those uh non as non-desirable um perpetrators i guess you could say to our area so in all i just wanted to say that i'm opposed to this this move um i love our community and i i want to keep it the way it is and uh, i can echo some of their comments as well I, you know i'd certainly be in favor of adding in some additional um, facilities and properties that echo kind of what what is going on in Parkland, and um, I appreciate everybody's comments. So thank you. Thank you very much. Craig Quenville. Okay. Mr. Quenville? So Mr. Quenville is on the line, but is not on mute. Uh, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. My name is Craig Kenville, and I live at 26 Elmhurst Street. That is four houses down the road from the proposed development. Since learning of the proposed planning application to Elmhurst Street 6, 10, and 14, I've had some time to research the official plan of the municipality of Middlesex Center, and I've had some time to examine the map of Kilworth Kamoka that is located on page schedule A-2. I would encourage everyone that is listening to spend some time getting to know the official plan of Middlesex Center. The official plan contains such important statements such as to identify, protect, sustain, and enhance where possible the natural environmental features and functions within the municipality's Greenland system, as well as densities proposed should be generally compatible with adjacent densities, and the excessive clustering of multiple dwellings shall be avoided. That is within Middlesex Center's own plan. What is being proposed here is to change a small portion of residential low density when Kilworth in its entirety, aside from the land set aside for commercial use, is all low density residential use. To make this change would be contrary to Middlesex Center's own plan. It seeks to change the structure of the Kilworth community. The existence of single family homes on single lots, the small town community feel that you've heard from so many people this evening, is what drew so many families, including ours, to Kilworth. This would negatively change the appearance of Old Kilworth and Elmhurst Street, both from a change in density to also overtaking some of the green space that is naturally occurring in the area. Council does have a plan to protect and sustain the natural and environmental features and functions of Kilworth. Regarding density, I would like Council to consider how drastic a change it would be to change three single family lots to 26 townhomes and 26 single detached dwellings. Not to mention the years it would take to make this adjustment, the amount of construction that would be necessary, the air, ground, water, and noise pollution that would be created by 56 families located in the space currently taken up by three single family dwelling lots. As mentioned, two cars per unit times 56 equals 112 cars dumping onto Little Elmhurst Street, clogging the roadway and creating pedestrian safety concerns on our narrow roads without street lights. Council must also take into consideration the precedence of accepting such an application. Who is to say that another developer or Suede Holdings itself won't go and buy up more properties within Kilworth and again seek to change the density from low residential to medium density? they would most certainly point to the acceptance of this application as a reason to accept another similar application. I urge council to reject this proposed application that seeks to change the Kilworth community and fill the coffers of an international developer. I thank council for listening to our concerns this evening. Okay, thank you. Um, 
Next up, we have Anne. Yeah. Okay, Anne Van Gilst. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, please, Anne. Hi, my name's Ann Van Gilst. I'm uh, from 43 Elmhurst Street, just down the street. Uh, thank you so much. I know it's getting late. Um, but uh, so I submitted a whole letter, letter, but I would like to focus on the environmental cost of the rezoning. Um, in the short term, of course, we've got the construction, garbage, the dust, the noise, the vibration, the increased carbon emissions, not to mention the water runoff as the land is stripped bare. These have all going, these are all going to have an impact on the environmentally sensitive area that is already designated in the woodlot, the close nearby river, and of course, the wildlife and the neighbors around. Um, but more so than the short term, it's the long term effects of the increase, increasing the density and the precedent it sets for other developers in the area. Um, old Kilworth is beautiful. And we are so privileged to live here. I hope you've had a chance to walk through. If you've walked here on a hot summer day, one of the first things you will notice is how much cooler it, our neighborhood is to the newer sections. That's not surprising because we know research is proving that hard, hardscape surfaces, I think that's what they're called, where houses are close together, surrounded by concrete with less mature trees are generally a few degrees hotter. The ratio of green to hardscape surfaces or is becoming an important component of good planning. And this is a particularly important in a time when the climate is heating up. We've got these unknowns like heat domes occurring. And we need to plan as a municipality to do what we can to mitigate what is coming with climate change. So what can we do? Most simply, we can protect the mature trees and green spaces that we have. This community has those already. The current plan of 56 units, it's like this big block of concrete of a few acres being plunked down. We know that the more trees we can save, we can cool the, keep the area cooler we can reduce the energy requirements for cooling these houses. So that's a very important um, component to consider in all your planning, um, not just this area. The second is, people have already mentioned, the building development will negatively impact our wildlife. With all the current developments in our area, habitats have already been reduced and impacted. You know that the proposed um, development sits beside the green corridor, along a river, but what you might not realize is how much our backyards are part of that green corridor. We have deer, foxes, rabbits, countless species of birds, uh, even coyotes running and hanging out in our yards. We have large, and not only in our yards on our side, but also the block over, and also in the properties under consideration. Our yards are part of the green corridor. It's part of the habitat. Um, and uh, the extra street lights, the traffic, the noise, the extra people will all contribute to um, damaging and impacting this fragile ecosystem that we have here. So um, I guess council, I'm just really hoping that you can hear our, please hear our cries, be forward thinking, consider the hidden costs. Be wise about the precedents you're setting. Let's protect what we have. This is a green corridor. We've got the mature trees. Let's protect them. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and now we move to Quinn. Oh, Ann Quinn, I'm sorry, I skipped one. Ann Quinn is next. Hello, can you hear me? 
And please go ahead. Can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, thank you very much. I just want to say many of the things that people have already voiced are my concerns as well. Uh, I just want to say thank you to council for, for uh, staying awake. It's past my bedtime. And um, I want to let you know that I live at Four Parkland Place and three of the proposed developments will back onto my yard, uh, three condos. So um, when my concerns regarding this proposed plan is that uh, centers on the reason for moving here in the first place, and that was and still is large lot size, single family homes, treat areas, well water and privacy. So I appreciate that Things must happen in that area. And I actually am in favor of some homes going in there, but I would like them to be more in keeping with what exists right now. I did a couple of calculations and that is that 56 homes means the potential for 200 plus people, 112 plus cars, 80 plus dogs, and more congestion on Glendon Drive. The calm in this subdivision allowing for Peaceful walks, bike riding, and children's play will evaporate as cars will become a major force on Parkland Place, which will require renaming as Motor Mud City Palace. Um, I think that the green space that Ann Van Gils mentioned is certainly of concern to me. And um, I would just like you to know that I'm opposed to this rezoning. Thank you. Thank you very much for your comments. Um, next up, John and Melissa McGlynn. Uh, pardon me, Mahama Hamoud is next. Hope I said that right. Okay, let's uh, move to Mark Sarkani. If we, let me, yes, we do have Mark on the call. <laughs> okay, so Mark. Oh, he's not there yet. Quite there yet? Shh, 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 quite. Okay, and feel free to prompt Mark at this time. Okay, Mark, are you are you able to hear me? I can hear you. Can you hear me? Okay, you could just go ahead now. Excellent. Trying to move uh, things I actually right didn't along realize here. I was slated to talk, but I do have a few uh, concerns. Clearly, I echo my neighbors and and being universally opposed to this um, for obvious reasons, but. Uh, I'm in a unique situation. I'm at the bottom of the hill and everybody's storm water eventually comes to my property and into uh, well, my, my small storm water pond, if that's what it is. Anyway, I am worried about five acres of grassland turning into five acres of concrete, turning into a lot more dirty water coming down and polluting everything and probably overloading what little storm water management we have in this area. So, you know, as emotionally, obviously I don't want this development in there. I think it, it ruins our, our little community, but practically speaking, it, there's some big concerns here with, with how the, everything will be managed. So I'll keep it short and thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you so much for your input. Yeah. Dave Thompson. Dave Thompson, you're up next. Hi there, can you hear me now? Yes, please, Dave. Great, thanks for including me, I really appreciate it. 
Uh, so thank you, Madam Mayor, uh, members of council and uh, committee. Uh, so my name is Dave Thompson. I'm here with my spouse, Lynn Williams. Uh, we live uh, on Elmhurst, five doors down from the proposed uh, development. Uh, we would be, I think, the newest members of um, the community having moved in in May of this year. So we were ecstatic to be welcomed into this community. Um, we love it here. Uh, and the part of the reason we moved here was because of the existing plan, the existing nature of the entire community. And in a market of skyrocketing real estate values, we invested significantly in order to acquire property here. So we clearly understood when we moved here that there was a plan and uh, we appreciated the plan and we appreciated the character of the uh, area and of the entire um, community in Kilworth, Kamoka. So we do respect the plans need to be adjusted, but this proposal is far from an adjustment in our opinion. So the um, proposal that's on the table here seems to throw the plan out the window entirely um, and be far and away more than the area um, needs or can sustain. Uh, so we urge the committee to um, uh, not accept uh, this proposal and not uh, move forward with it and to oppose it. So thank you very, very much for, uh, for the time and for uh, putting this on the agenda on, on short notice. Thanks. And to my neighbors as well for all their comments. And thank you to you for participating. Uh, Jessica Feist? Okay, our next resident is Jessica Feist. A feast. Feast, pardon me. They are not unmuting to take their opportunity to speak. Oh. Okay, in that case, we'll. Is he on? Okay, Joel, if you're there, you can come on. Hello? Joel? No. Yes, yes, you're on now, please. Great, great, great. Thank you. Um, so good evening, uh, Mayor and Council and, uh, and the committee. Um, I live at uh, 16 Parkland Place. Um, I'm also representing uh, my neighbor, Linda Fuster, um, a single lady who is not that versed in computer skills, but uh, by all means uh, is very uh, attached to this uh, proposal. Uh, she lives at 20 Parkland Place and uh, both of us uh, I would say um, after listening to some of the north, south, east, west uh, controversy uh, earlier, we would be considered uh, on the south side of this development on Parkland and uh, you know, have a vested interest in just what happens here. Uh, we've been here 18 years. I believe Lynn has been here quite a bit longer, but um, we're also neighbors with the Van Longensteins and uh, I think they spoke uh, very eloquently as well as the rest of the neighbors um, about this, uh, this amendment to uh, this piece of property. And again, just echoing my neighbors, um, there's a large bits of property here. Um, when they're combined, they give the opportunity for a developer to come in, a developer to come in and uh, want to change the plan of the community. Um, I'm not opposed to that, but I think it needs to be done in a, in a, in a you know, a, a manner that enhances the, uh, the development here. Um, we do have probably, as you're well aware of by now, the oldest part of the community in Kilworth. And, uh, you know, we've enjoyed, a, right from the start, a very peaceful and, uh, you know, um, unique type of, uh, community. Um, I'm not going to go into all the other concerns that have been raised because I think they've been better than very, very well. Um, I do have a concern with the traffic on Parkland Place. Um, 
I did a little bit of measuring. Uh, at its widest, it's about 19 feet. At its probably least, it's about 18. So it kind of varies as you go down the road. I didn't know how to put that into context until I measured my own two-car driveway, which is actually 20 feet and uh, 20 feet wide. Um, we've got two large vehicles, and it's sometimes uh, difficult for us to get in and out behind or in front of each other. Um, so definitely the, the size of the road, uh, which most of the traffic is going to be holding, um, needs to be addressed. And I just don't think it's capable uh, of handling that type of uh, intensification. Uh, it worries me that the construction traffic, uh, the cement mixers, the cranes, the bulldozers, the excavators, we're all going to come down this street. It's very difficult to get any of these vehicles in off of uh, the highway down Elmhurst as well it's very hard for them to get out. Um, I don't know whether council knows that road, but it has a steep uh, incline up to the highway. It, it poses problems for us in the wintertime getting up that hill. If you get stopped behind two or three cars, it's really tough to get out and it's becoming more and more uh, kind of a jackrabbit uh, exit out of that uh, intersection to get up to the, the, uh, the speed of the flow of traffic. As well, um, it gives the opportunity for people that don't want to go all the way around to uh, to try and jump through traffic in a in an area that's got no left turn lane or doesn't actually require um, any left hand turning. But um, I still see it happening. Uh, so I'm concerned about the traffic. Uh, we don't have sidewalks here. We have roads. The roads are the way that uh, we get around our subdivision. I uh, came home tonight, there was three sets of seniors walking on the road. They're not the best of hearing. They walk two abreast. Um, I just, I'm really worried about the amount of traffic and construction traffic uh, going down this road. Uh, Sorry, so Joel, can you just wrap up, please? Is there anything new that you want to have, add that hasn't been said yet? Yeah, the only thing I really want to talk about is I have a, we're all on wells over here, and uh, I've got a, quite a concern about uh, the impact uh, of this uh, development on our well water. I have a shallow well. I can lift the lid and see to the bottom. I've got about half of it full of water, good water. And uh, being that that's that shallow, um, I'm worried about the interruption or the contamination of that uh, of that drinking water that we use daily. And okay, thank you. I'm sorry. I'm going to have to ask you to stop now. We're trying to really stay to five minutes. We've gone over. Thank you. And Bert Vermulen is next. Oh, they cut me off. No, I cut you off. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> oh dear. Five minutes doesn't take long. <laughs> Hi, this is Bert. Can you hear me? Yes, go ahead, Bert. Okay, so uh, I live at uh, 8 Parkland Place, and good evening. Thanks for hearing me out. Uh, we're here on uh, 8 Parkland Place, and my name is Bert Vermeulen. Um, we very enjoy the neighborhood. You heard that a lot of people do that. So we are also, our backyard is uh, basically the site that's for, up for development. Now, right now we have a really nice uh, fence with all kind of trees and, and so on. And the way I see it is that the proposal is that all that stuff comes down and it will be replaced by a fence that is six feet high. So basically our privacy is gone right away. And the years and years of trees is gone. Um, wildlife, we had, you know, in the, uh, in the winter, every time we have seven, eight deer in the, in the backyard and all that will be uh, disrupted. The other concern what we have is uh, the septic and well water, but our neighbor here said too, it's true. You know, we have uh, excellent water, what we want to keep. Um, so um, what will happen to our places? Are we being forced to also hook in to uh, the sewer system while they're bringing around the corner? And our street, I understand, will be all uprooted for it to, uh, to get that passed around the corner. And also, yeah, we also have a disabled child and child with disability and she can bike by herself here in the quiet street. And, you know, that's also a big concern for us. That will be most likely over too. Um, 
yeah, the other concerns uh, are basically addressed by a lot of others already, so you know how we feel. And, you know, what was mentioned with earlier in this meeting too, was basically, why is it that those big developments cannot take place in uh, this, the surrounding area behind uh, Footland and so on? Because they're talking about, you know, big places, and I think that's where those developments should go. And that we stay in a neighborhood like here, just on septic and well water, whatever is being uh, developed here. And thank you for your time. Good night. Thank you very much, Bert. Good night. Um, we have to, I'll read the piece. So th that's it for the people who've registered. But if there are members of the public who are attending this meeting virtually and would, who would like to comment on the ap application, if you would please use your raise hand feature now and um, the clerk will make sure that you can get in. One additional speaker, Greg Collins. Okay. Is he there? Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, Mr. Robinson? Yes. If you would please give your full name and address for the record as you hadn't registered previously, and then we're sticking to five minutes. I know it's hard, but- Absolutely. Yeah, yep. your points. So it's, yeah, it's Greg Robinson, live at 35 Wind Green Lane. Um, I'm not nearly directly attached to the construction, but uh, I do have several concerns when it comes to roadway, traffic, and construction vehicles. So I live right near the other construction that was happening. And the problem that we have had constantly is nobody from the municipality cares about enforcing the flow of traffic and the construction vehicles where there is clearly marked signs that people do not follow, pay attention to, or accept as interruption to other people's households. So the challenge that I have here is I drive on the very first road that we have available as an entranceway because there are two roads within that very close stretch before the bridge and towards Kilworth where there are roads where there are single entry points only, single turning lanes only. And I have seen countless times where we have had people trying to turn left down Old River Road, literally holding up traffic in an 80 kilometer an hour zone. That, that area, that stretch of area has actually been turned into a 70 kilometer an hour zone. And not a lot of people pay attention to those road signs along with the no left turn road signs. So the challenge that I have here is I not only completely concur with other individuals stating about the speed of traffic and the potential hazards for people walking. I see it all the time. We do not have sidewalks in that area. I drive slow. I'm probably one of the only few people that drive 35 to 40 kilometers in the 40 kilometer span in front of the park. And the Mr. huge- Robinson, Mr. Yes. Robinson, Mr. Robinson, um, is there anything you want to add with respect to the development? I've noted the um, comments with respect to construction and traffic, but if we could stick to the, the another point, if you have one uh, that you could raise or that you want to raise. Yes, so the as far as I'm concerned, bringing in that amount of density housing, for individuals with lack of green space are going to immediately traverse into the current green spaces we have available. Thus, disproportionately uh, um, altering the amount of traffic and or potential garbage parking that is gonna take away from the green space based upon the previously designated density that already exists today. Thank you very much. Thank All you. right, thank you. I think that's it. Okay, I'm now going to turn to council. Councilor Cates. 
thank you through you, Madam Mayor. So I will try hard not to mention what everybody has already said, but um, I do want to say, it has been said, but I do want to say that uh, I have concern at how narrow Elmhurst is. Um, and it, you, there's a steep hill right at, uh, at the intersection at Elmhurst and Glendon, um, quite a steep hill actually. Um, I spent some time looking through the Middlesex County environmental assessment um, that lays out the plan for Glendon Drive from, uh, from the Kilworth Bridge to the 402. And I only could find one mention of it. Uh, currently there's no left turn coming from London uh, onto Elmhurst. Um, uh, but, uh, and it's noted as a high risk area. Uh, but in the plan, um, once they, you know, widen Glendon, um, it will be have a left hand turn lane. Um, and um, uh, hopefully the speed limit is also lower to 50. So that should slow, uh, slow it down a little bit. But the actual roadway itself turning on there is quite risky. So I want to make sure that that's looked at. Um, uh, and I forgot to say, I, I want to start. I wanted to start out by saying thank you to everybody. I talked to so many of you, um, and so many letters and comments and emails, and I just want to say thank you. Um, so, I I would I want to focus now on the actual layout and development itself. So it says that the lot sizes are forty feet and twenty three feet. Uh, assuming the townhouses are 23 feet. Um, and so a total of 56 homes. It says two car parking, uh, but it's front and back. So that's, you know, I'm in the garage, you're in the driveway, move your car. Uh, I am not a fan of that at all. I think that we, we definitely, and I don't even know if it's addressed in our information, but we need it to be double wide. Uh, double wide parking, which then would mean some wider lots. Um, this is this is pretty full. Um, the I just don't want to go in the wrong order here. Um, so I'm proposing the 40 foot lot wide lots are wider so that you can park double car wide, which maybe then would be a double car garage, but it's the two car uh, parking side by side. So now when we look at the, um, the townhouses, if you zoom in there in the middle, so in the center, you have the amenity area with visitor parking. But when you look at the townhouses, there's no back door. They're front and back attached. So there's no back door. So they have no backyard. So one, it's pretty easy to assume that families are gonna live in these. So where do your kids play? Are you gonna send your kids out onto the road because there's no sidewalks in here and go tell them, just go past the visitor parking. Don't talk to any strangers you might see and play in that middle area. Uh, and come back in a half an hour or whatever. Like it's, it's like, it's, sorry, it's getting late. It's packing it in like it's a project uh, development or something. But uh, so I think that, you know, at least give everybody their own backyard. Um, I think that that is extremely, uh, extreme intensification. Um, so let me see here. No, uh, yeah, in no back no back door like is that even is that even uh safe if there's a fire you got one way out um uh, <clears throat> the other thing is the parkland lots of people have talked about talked about the parkland if you're thinking that you know this is probably going to be a lot of uh more young younger family type development and you don't have a sidewalk uh, what about some parkland? Um, originally, when I looked at this, I saw the significant woodland was shown on seven of the lots. So my original thought was uh, perhaps that just needs to be a park and leave that significant woodland there. I did read the report about it's actually upon further review, it's said to be that it's mostly walnut trees, which secrete an oil and they're not native and they can 
hamper native things moving. So, um, you know, maybe it shouldn't be those. Uh, but I do think that a parkland, I was thinking leave the, leave the trees there and have a parkland. Um, <clears throat> Also, when it comes to the trees, I had some people that I spoke to that live around there talked about how I'm assuming on the opposite side of their fence, but on this property, there was uh, big, huge trees that provided privacy and shade and some big oak trees. Uh, so I just wanted to add, is there anything that we can do that puts a plan in place to help save some of the uh, existing trees that aren't necessarily in the way of anything. Um, and let me just see. That. So yes to the, you know, if there, if there's currently there's proposed 56, which I think it could be a lot, uh, a lot less than that, but yes, in doubling the size of the, of the whole entire area. Uh, I think that the, uh, there's been the comments already, but I did have it noted here that a lot of people were concerned about the effects that this could have on their existing wells and septics. Just to just to highlight to put it into perspective as well, this is calling for 56 units and Dosset development has 34 and Earl's Court has 30. So just to give an idea there to actually say some numbers. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor. Is there anyone else? I don't see any hands. So um, we do have a motion before us. Uh, that report, PLA 83 2021 regarding zoning bylaw amendment applications. Um, that is said BA 16 2021. An official plan amendment application OPA 57 and plan of condominium application 39T MCCDM 2101 filed by LDS consultants on behalf of um, Swede, Swede. Holdings Inc. for lands known as 6, 10, and 14 Elmhurst Street in Kilworth. You receive for information. Uh, do I have a mover and a seconder, please? Uh, Councillor Shipley and Councillor Arts. All in favor? And that is carried. Okay, so now at this point, we still have um, bylaws. Oh, is there any other business I should ask that was not asked before? <coughs> No, seeing no, no other business than we have bylaws. Uh, there are five of them and the motion is that bylaw 2021 number 87 and bylaw uh, 2021 95 through 98 be adopted as printed. Uh, could I have a mover please and a seconder. Councillor Heffernan and Councillor Scott, all in favor? Thank you. And for adjournment uh, that the Council for Municipality and Middlesex Center adjourns the October 27th 2021 council meeting at 10 12 p.m. Councillor Brennan and Councillor Cates. Thank you, everyone. The meeting is adjourned. I appreciate your.